Coming up next, a hearing held on Capitol Hill earlier today by the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. The panel met to consider the reauthorization for the Federal Communications Commission. This hearing was chaired by Congressman Edward Markey, a Democrat from Massachusetts. You will hear testimony from the chairman of the FCC and four communications commissioners. Good morning. Today the subcommittee will hold a hearing on legislation authorizing appropriations for the Federal Communications Commission for fiscal years 1992 and 1993, introduced yesterday by Representative Matt Rinaldo and myself. I'd like to welcome Chairman Al Sykes, as well as the other four commissioners, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Quello, Ms. Marshall, and Mr. Duggan here today to testify on behalf of the FCC's budget request. It is not often that we have the opportunity to have all of the commissioners up here on the Hill. I'd like uh, to remind uh, everyone that this is a legislative hearing on the FCC's authorization for the next two fiscal years. And we don't want to get uh, bogged down today with the momentous issue decided by the Commission yesterday, so I would advise all members to not just completely focus upon the children's TV decision yesterday and uh, <laughs> try to uh, uh, broaden out the range of issues that you, you would uh, discuss today with the uh, Commissioners. The Commission has tremendous responsibilities to, in our nation's rapidly changing technological environment. Today, as we enter an unprecedented period in the evolution of America's telecommunications industries, the role of the FCC is critical to promoting a competitive marketplace, providing timely and effective regulation, and encouraging the continued development of efficient, innovative communications facilities and services. Some pending Commission proceedings could adversely affect our ability to attain these goals, such as the AT&T dominance docket, the equal charge rules, and the Commission's continual reliance on non-structural safeguards despite the Ninth Circuit's remand of the Computer Inquiry 3 decision. The Commission and its staff must not only be adept managers of public policies, as new sophisticated technologies emerge, but also must understand the complex domestic marketplace in which these new technologies preside. Moreover, the FCC needs to comprehend fully how emerging technologies will affect U.S. competitiveness and our economic vitality as we prepare for the year 2000. As the FCC addresses the plethora of issues under its jurisdiction, from cable television to wireless technologies and from FinCEN to HDTV, it is important to recognize the link between telecommunications, education, a society that is info-rich, and economic development. It is imperative that we remain cognizant of the interrelation of these various elements of our nation's telecommunications community, as well as the importance that decisions we make today will have on America's future. Yesterday's decision regarding the financial interest and syndication rules represents commission recognition of the new marketplace in which broadcasters compete. It is important to ensure the maintenance of free over-the-air broadcasting as a vital component of our telecommunications network, and the FCC's decision may assist in this endeavor. It is equally important to recognize, however, that FinCEN is part of a larger debate, that free TV should not be looked at solely from the standpoint of the network's relationship to Hollywood, but also from the standpoint of their relationship to cable television and other potential providers of video services such as the telephone companies. It has become increasingly apparent that broadcasters are at long-term risk. It is critical 
to fashion a role for the broadcasting industry that reflects their interrelation with other providers of video services, but also recognizes their long history of service in the public interest, protecting the principles of localism, diversity, and universal service embodied in the 1934 Communications Act. As advertising revenues are increasingly divided among more and more providers of video services, and as we witness the nichification of channels and programming that cater to smaller and smaller market segments, the subcommittee will continue its oversight to ensure that legislation and regulations in this area protect the principles of public interest and free over-the-air broadcasting. My primary concern will be to ensure that all consumers, whether they be minorities, the underclass, the disabled, or those living in rural America, have equal access to the richness of the information age. Our policy debates, therefore, should not revolve around simply deciding how to divide the economic pie, but rather on how these decisions will ultimately affect consumers, viewers. I feel strongly that the FCC must have the resources needed to implement congressional policies, to regulate the dynamic burgeoning telecommunications industry and to carry out its statutory responsibilities to promote the public interest. As we in the Congress press the Commission to reduce delays when considering applications, to speed up its testing and type processing activities, and to increase its enforcement activities, I believe it is imperative that we provide it adequate resources to perform the job that we ask to have done. The bill authorizes the full FCC budget request for fiscal year 1992 of $133.4 million and its fiscal year 1993 request of $163.5 million. The amount for fiscal year 92 represents an increase of $17.6 million over the FCC's fiscal year 91 appropriation. This 15.2 percent increase represents increased funding for programs, funding for 50 additional staff, technical equipment for the field, information systems, and consolidation of the Commission's headquarters facilities. This increased funding is needed for the agency <clears throat> to discharge its public interest responsibilities. The 1993 budget increase includes one-time costs for the Commission's physical relocation, and the long overdue upgrading of its computer automation system as well as funding for 75 additional staff for the Commission's enforcement, rulemaking and licensing activities. The Commission is also requesting authority to collect 65 to 70 million dollars in new user fees from its 3 million users of FCC services and licensees to cover most of the budgeted 70.8 million cost of policymaking, enforcement, public service, and international functions. We look forward to hearing from all of the commissioners today. We thank you all for, um, for your participation. Time for opening statement of the chair has expired. Now turn to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from the state of New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to join you and my colleagues at this oversight hearing on the activities of the Federal Communications Commission. In my judgment, there is no more important regulatory agency in the federal government, or one whose actions and decisions affect the lives of more Americans than the FCC. From broadcast and cable television, to local and long distance telephone service, to computers, to AM and FM radio, to cellular phones, to high-definition television. The FCC is an agency that shoulders a tremendous responsibility. And I certainly want to welcome uh, Chairman Sykes and the other commissioners before the subcommittee this morning. And at the outset, I would like to commend them for their hard work and the tough decisions that they've rendered lately. If there was any doubt about the toughness of some of the decisions you face, I believe that the last few weeks have erased it. And if you look at the Commissioner's action yesterday, and I'm not talking about children's TV, it is very instructive. The Commission voted to modify the financial interest and in syndication rules by a close vote of three to two. 
And it was closer than three to two because Commissioner <coughs> Quello concurred in part with that decision. <coughs> NBC said that the new, quote, the new regulatory scheme threatens the survival of free over-the-air television. ABC was very disappointed. CBS said the Commission's action adds, quote, layer upon layer of new regulation that will continue to put free over-the-air affiliate network television at risk. But that didn't mean that the production community was happy. They were probably even less happy than the networks. The Coalition to Preserve the Financial Interest and Syndication Rule called the Commission's action, quote, a tragedy for independent television producers and the American viewing public. When a political decision gets such uniformly bad reviews as that, it's important to sift through the rhetoric and make a judgment based on the facts. I'm very sensitive to the different views of the networks and program producers, but I don't intend this morning, and I don't think we should pass final judgment on the Commission's <clears throat> action. I want the opportunity to carefully analyze the fine print in the Commission's decision because the appropriate and legitimate function of our subcommittee is to examine the Commission's actions and their impact on public policy. But there's an additional reason as well. Both sides have indicated they will petition for reconsideration of this decision, and the debate will probably continue. At a minimum, I hope the commissioners will flesh out their views this morning and give us a deeper understanding of why they feel this decision is a step forward and how it balances the concerns of producers that the networks are a bottleneck and must be restrained with the network's own desire to compete more vigorously in what they've termed a changed marketplace. I have to pass, a, a move on, and I certainly want to mention the fact that the Commission, in my view, faces similar problems with other telecommunications issues. The modified final judgment and attempts to change it raise nearly identical issues of bottleneck control and how to assure fair competition. In the debate over cable TV, we're struggling to balance the needs of competitors fairly and to stimulate increased competition to local cable operators. The goal of the subcommittee, and I hope the goal of the commission, is how to make the playing field level for all participants. That is true not only in the debate over the financial interest and syndication rules, but in other matters as well. The commission has an ongoing proceeding over the dominance of AT&T, and I hope they can shed some light on where that docket stands and when it will be concluded. I know that the testimony we will receive this morning will give us a greater appreciation of the Commissioner's views, and I'm looking forward to the exchanges and the responses to the questions that many members on this committee have. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time to leave as much as possible for their testimony and the questions that we all have. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Scheuer. I thank the Chair. <coughs> And I'll speak only very briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman. We all want to hear the witnesses. <clears throat> uh, yesterday's uh, de decision was <clears throat> not the end, not the beginning of the end, not the end of the beginning, but the beginning of the beginning. And we're going to be revisiting uh, this subject <clears throat> many times in the months and years to come. And uh, I look forward with great pleasure uh, to participating in this incredibly uh, stimulating uh, subject. Uh, let me take a mole's eye view of history here for just a moment uh, this morning. Uh, you heard the chairman say that <clears throat> the uh, broadcasters are at long-term risk. And you heard him say that we're going to scrutinize how these rulings affect consumers and viewers. <clears throat> let me put a little footnote on that uh, interesting comment of your chairman and say not only are the broad over-the-air broadcasters at long-term risk, the New York city metropolitan area of uh, 22 million people is at long-term risk. That's where these three over-the-air networks reside. That's where their corporate headquarters are. That's uh, where they employ in New York uh, State alone 28,000 employees with a payroll of just under a billion dollars, 900 and some odd million dollars. Uh, they spend, they spend 
two billion dollars, two billion dollars in New York City and state and in New Jersey. So the economic impact of weakening the network's uh, full uh, competitive uh, spirit and initiative to l limit them in surviving and prospering and expanding could have serious, in fact, devastating impacts on New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, where these folks live and spend their money, and where the networks spend their money. It is no uh, top secret matter in this country that economic influence and power, as well as uh, people, uh, have shifted to from the Northeast uh, Corridor uh, to the South, the Southwest, and the West. Uh, that has all already <clears throat> crippled and hurt the the economy of the Northeast, including New York, New Jersey, and so forth. Uh, we're already struggling. New York has received many economic blows. Uh, <clears throat> you've all you all read the papers. Uh, there's nothing that I have to emphasize this morning. But this blow, if it comes, <coughs> crippling the network's ability uh, to uh, use their resources, to use their imagination, to use their initiative and their competitive instincts, would add a crippling additional body blow to the economy of New York and the well-being of 22 million people in the New York metropolitan area, what we call the SMSA, the Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area. And while you may not think this is the top priority of your mission as FCC commissioners, uh, it's a looming presence that is there as you deliberate and as you come to conclusions. Uh, your decisions will have enormous consequences. Most of our life decisions have some consequences, but the implications to the, the New York society and the economy of the uh, Northeast Corridor are tremendous, and I hope you will not lose sight of them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of California, Mr. Moorhead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to Chairman Sykes, Commissioners Coelho, Marshall, Barrett and Dugan. Uh, we appreciate having you here this morning, especially after all that you've gone through with this uh, decision recently. As this subcommittee begins the reauthorization of the FCC, it's clear to all of us that the challenges before the Commission during this time of unprecedented change are enormous. You'll be asked repeatedly to make difficult decisions while nearly everyone around you shouts advice and counsel. The Commission has just emerged from such a decision on the financial interest and syndication rule. It's unlikely that the FinCEN has been put to rest, so none of us can be certain of its final outcome. As a representative of two major studios, I'm not overjoyed by yesterday's decision, but I also believe that out of the situations like this, opportunity for new alliances and practices can emerge. I would certainly expect this from the creative Hollywood community. And incidentally, there are just as many jobs in the Hollywood Los Angeles area in broadcasting and in the studios and in producers as there are in New York. So we are every bit as concerned about the things that are being done as they are in the other part of the country. I also see danger in this decision for producers. In the recent op-ed piece of the Los Angeles Times, Governor Wilson of California wrote that without the current FinCEN rules, independent producers would be subjected to strong-arm, take-it-or-leave-it bargaining tactics. I would ask the Commission, this subcommittee and the producers, to help me make sure that such abuses do not occur under any circumstances. I would also ask unanimous consent that a copy of Governor Wilson's editorial be placed in the record. Again, I appreciate the challenge that is before the Commission. I'm grateful for your objective expertise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. First of all, let me associate myself with your remarks. I think that uh, they were very on point and very important, particularly the paragraph that talked about the Commission's responsibilities on the technological environment. In my view, the oversight of this subcommittee is one of Congress's most important functions. 
The only way we really can assure uh, that our constituents and the American public that the FCC is doing its job is through hearings like this. You know, in preparation for today's hearings, I reviewed just a few of the many issues which the FCC now has pending or is scheduled to consider in the coming year, literally from A, as in auctions, to Z, in zoning uh, restrictions on satellite dishes. Uh, there is a tremendous uh, menu out there of decisions which they will have to make. As a member of both this subcommittee and the Judiciary Committee's uh, antitrust subcommittee, I'm particularly interested in the FCC's activities regarding the promotion of competition. Uh, this topic alone uh, would be enough for a separate oversight hearing, and I hope that the chairman uh, will have additional opportunities to exercise these uh, oversight responsibilities during this session. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the FCC commissioners to address these issues of interest to, uh, which have uh, mutual constituencies. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair will recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd too like to welcome the chairman and other members of the uh, commission for being here today uh, on their reauthorization the hearing. Uh, listening to my friend from California and my friend from New York, didn't realize that the FinCEN issue was such a jobs uh, issue. Uh, we don't have that particular problem in Ohio. I wish we perhaps did, but uh, it's interesting to, uh, to hear it from that perspective. We've got uh, so many uh, issues before us and so many issues before the FCC, and uh, I'll make my remarks quite brief on only to say that uh, under the reauthorization, the uh, FCC uh, seeks a 15.2 percent increase, and while on the surface that may appear to be uh, rather large in the budgetary constraints that we're under. Uh, clearly, with the issues that are facing uh, all of you, uh, including uh, the uh, equal charge policy under the uh, modified final judgment, uh, effective competition uh, in the cable, uh, and we expect to hopefully hear from you uh, by next month uh, on that, uh, and to a large extent what happens uh, with the Commission will determine what happens uh, in this committee. Uh, the repeal of the MFJ uh, on the manufacturing uh, issue, uh, which we would expect uh, uh, to uh, see uh, happen in this Congress, and uh, the uh, responsibilities that the Commission will have uh, regarding the regulations after that uh, is uh, passed. Uh, spectrum allocation, uh, we now have two million licensed radio users in this country uh, with the uh, effort uh, at turning loose some of the uh, spectrum uh, that's allocated to the government. We would expect that to grow and uh, hopefully prosper. But again, that will uh, place enormous burdens on, uh, on you people. Uh, the addict basement review of regulations, which the chairman has talked about uh, several times uh, here before the committee, uh, is an important uh, role for a uh, regulatory agency to play from time to time, and clearly uh, now is the time. Uh, and to overhaul your computer system, which I understand is a five-year program of about $30 million, but clearly I think can be justified uh, based on uh, the enormous responsibilities that, uh, that you five uh, will have. Uh, and so uh, without any particular comments on a uh, subject that is near and dear to us and has been uh, in the popular media for the last uh, several uh, days, uh, and looking forward to the appearance of the uh, chairman of the full committee, uh, we uh, welcome you and look forward to uh, some debate uh, on the uh, reauthorization uh, uh, portion uh, of this particular hearing and also uh, the uh, other issues that may come uh, come up before the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you, Chairman. The, uh, the issues for me uh, are squarely on the question and issue of process. The whole financial interest syndication debate was uh, tried to be focused on one of uh, preserving free television. I guess from my constituents' perspective, the issue is free for who? And how will that be preserved? Uh, part of my process concern, and I will explore it in, in my question period, uh, is the issue of the efficacy and independence of this agency to meet the public interest test that is at the core of the statute that created you. I have not stated ever publicly, but I guess I should do so now, that, uh, that I believe those financial interest indication rules needed to be changed. Uh, for instance, I believe, or I've at least reached uh, in my own mind, that the uh, MFJ decision should be removed uh, from a federal judge 
whether you like what he has done or not, and be given to an agency that has both the expertise and the independence to make quality, substantive, public policy decisions, subject to the oversight of those of us uh, who are elected. My concerns about the way FinCEN was ultimately handled, though, uh, were reflected in the level of the debate. Frankly, I was terribly disturbed that questions of uh, commissioners' hobbies ought to be raised as part of this discussion. Whether uh, the hiring of lobbyists who may have been former employers of commissioners at one time is relevant to this debate. As to which commissioner was, is, or will be someone else's protege is irrelevant to this debate. Uh, as to what level of loyalty you feel constrained to bow to the appointing agent that puts you on that commission uh, is of some concern to me. As to the efficacy of the Sunshine Rule, which prohibits paid representatives from contacting you, but not elected representatives who may have the same deep and abiding interests in the outcome of these decisions as those who wear those very expensive suits uh, and seated, uh, are seated behind you. Uh, which members of Congress and their staff, which government agencies or their staffs called you uh, and involved themselves in that deliberative process uh, is indeed some concern to me. Mr. Chairman, if you believe as I do, and Mr. Chairman there too, that you have a significant independent public trust to uphold, and I want to help you uphold it, agreeing or disagreeing with the finality of your decision, but basing that confidence in your ability to affect good public policy in an independent, dispassionate, responsible way, then I think this committee needs to explore the ability and the efficacy of the commission to reach these important decisions. That's where I'm coming from. I want to, I want to repose trust in you. I want to believe, as I think each of you do individually, that you have the ability to answer these tough questions forthrightly and honestly. But I want to also make sure that we have learned the lessons of this, of this debate, a debate that was carried out as much uh, uh, in the press and as much, unfortunately, about extraneous issues uh, uh, as, unfortunately, sometimes at least uh, for my uh, uh, distanced uh, position uh, uh, on, on the substance. Uh, I look forward to this hearing and I certainly look forward to, to querying the, the Commission because I believe, uh, I believe a lot of America's future in terms of jobs and economic opportunity is in, is in your hands. I yield back the balance of my time. Mm. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from the State of Alabama, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to welcome the panel and I will waive any further remarks at this time and look forward to the testimony. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from the state of New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for holding uh, this very timely hearing on the FCC reauthorization. Obviously, the issue of uh, financial syndication uh, over, uh, overshadows other important FCC matters that uh, I'm concerned with. Uh, such as EEO, and uh, I hope in the course of the opening uh, questions, Mr. Chairman, to, to ask Commissioners uh, Quello and Dugan uh, why they have, in my judgment, cast some votes that uh, are not consistent, in my judgment, with the Commission's mandate on EEO. And, and on the issue, Mr. Chairman, that we are, I think, uh, dealing with today, and that's the decision made uh, by uh, the FCC yesterday, the three to two vote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I'm, while I'm sympathetic to the fact that uh, the networks are no longer the giants in the television market and are up against uh, obviously increasing competitions from cable, uh, pay TV, home video, and others, I'm somewhat concerned about the impact uh, of the Commission's decision yesterday on small and minority producers who may not have the capital or cash flow of the larger studios. Uh, 
I understand that Commissioner Marshall may have similar concerns. I think that the Commission has no more important public interest responsibility than the preservation of diversity and competition and communications. Uh, in a pluralistic society like ours, diversity means ensuring that all voices have an opportunity to be heard and that all Americans have an opportunity to hear those voices. Uh, I understand that the Commission heard literally from dozens of black, Hispanic, female producers, all of whom supported some kind of retention of, uh, of the rule, or at the very least, uh, essential safeguards for their creative independence. And from the reports I've heard about the action the Commission took yesterday, smaller independent producers are possibly likely to suffer the most under the new regulatory structure. I would be interested in, uh, in probing that uh, in, in the questions. And that directly contradicts the long-established federal policy to promote diversity and competition in the programming uh, marketplace. And I'm, I'm very concerned about that. I obviously, uh, being a minority, uh, have, have advocated many of these issues. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, minority producers. I'm concerned about the lack of minority programming, both in the studios and in the networks. But obviously, uh, this is something that uh, we are going to be probing, Mr. Chairman. Let me just conclude by, uh, by simply saying that uh, I hope now that uh, if there does appear to be a need to uh, change the commission rule, that uh, once again, uh, whatever the vote may be in, in a vote here in this committee, that we not shirk our responsibility in protecting uh, the public interest. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, once again, uh, even though we are talking about substantial financial stakes, $5 billion uh, in reruns, uh, we are talking about matters of policy. It's not just an issue of who will get richer. I think there are substantial uh, public interest policies here that we have to settle. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from the state of Texas, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like unanimous consent to enter a written statement, but express my appreciation to the members for the time they're giving us today and for the agony that goes into the many decisions they have to make and appreciate the job they're doing. The gentleman's time has expired and without objection the gentleman's written statement will be included in the record at the appropriate point. Um, there are no other members uh, seeking recognition at this time for the purpose of making an opening statement so we'll turn to our, our guest this morning. Um, Al Sykes, the uh, chairman of the Federal Communications uh, Commission, joined by his uh, fellow commissioners. Uh, we would, uh, at any point you feel comfortable, Mr. Uh, chairman, um, welcome your uh, testimony. And any of the other commissioners that would uh, seek recognition for the uh, purpose of uh, making an opening statement, if such would be your wish. Uh, please uh, indicate at the point at which Mr. Sykes has con concluded, uh, or else we'll go uh, directly to the question and answer period. Um, whenever you're ready, Mr. Chairman, please uh, begin your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate, uh, as I know my colleagues do, the opportunity to appear before you. Uh, I will uh, abbreviate uh, my uh, testimony, a full measure of which has been filed with the subcommittee. With, this, with me this morning are my colleagues, as well as our bureau chiefs and office heads, and we look forward to responding to your questions. Let me summarize first our reauthorization request and then explain how our key programs relate to the five major goals the Commission adopted two years ago those goals being excellence in communications, adaptive regulation, innovation, international competitiveness, and improved FCC service to the public. We recommend two-year legislation authorizing $133.5 million in appropriations for fiscal year 1992 and $163.5 million for fiscal year 1993. We also recommend several non-controversial Technical Communications Act amendments. Our recommended funding levels represent a 15 percent increase, half of which reflects non-discretionary spending. 
The balance will be targeted to four important areas, namely, first, improving our service authorization process to further our goal of ensuring excellent service to the public. This will entail speeding up our licensing so firms can get into business faster and the public receive new services and options sooner. Second, restoring our technology base, which will involve large-scale improvement of our Laurel, Maryland laboratory. This will support several of our goals, such as ensuring adaptive regulation and an environment conducive to innovation. Third, continuing our efforts to adapt FCC regulations to today's competitive market realities, which we must do to continue to foster innovation, to keep American business globally competitive, and to serve U.S. consumers. And fourth, modernizing our computer systems, because just as other government agencies and most of the American economy, our effectiveness depends on how well our computers function. Before reviewing our substantive efforts, Mr. Chairman, let me briefly comment on the new FCC fees program which the administration has recommended. Currently, the FCC collects about $41 million a year. These are basically transaction charges to reimburse the government for the cost of license application processing, permits, and the like. Under the expanded FCC fees program, which the administration has proposed and I strongly support, the FCC will assess fees to cover the cost of our policymaking, enforcement, and certain international functions. We estimate this will mean additional receipts of from 65 to $70 million in fiscal 1992. Let me now turn, Mr. Chairman, to our key programs and accomplishments. This morning I would like to focus on four initiatives which we have reviewed with the subcommittee staff but which have not previously been discussed at public hearings. We have, of course, recently had hearings uh, on uh, cable and uh, on uh, the uh, Dingle Markey Spectrum Bill, and so we've covered a number of items in those hearings, but I'd like to cover a couple of additional items in my opening remarks today. In 1986, when I was at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, a major policy challenge surfaced. It concerned the issue of high-definition television. The initial challenge concerned establishing a global high-definition television production standard. Without going into detail, I would point out that steps were taken leading to the United States supporting a common imaging system, which is a production system, which is, excuse me, transmission system and industrial policy neutral. During the same general time period, the FCC began a process which has since been significantly defined by this commission, which will lead to the adoption of a U.S. high-definition television standard in 1993. The standard will be set after a comprehensive testing effort that will commence this summer. We will be taking steps to establish a simulcasting approach. That is, for a time, television will be broadcast using both the existing NTSC system and the new HDTV standard. After the turn of the century, when the current embedded base of home receivers has been replaced, NTSC broadcasts will, I presume, be phased out and the channels made available for other communications, in a sense establishing a new spectrum reserve. I believe the overall U.S. effort has been successful. Fortune magazine recently reported on how the United States is now in the lead internationally in developing digital HDTV. Our experts agree with that assessment. I think it is also important to note that this position has been achieved by uh, some important U.S. companies. When I first appeared before the subcommittee in 1989 in support of FCC reauthorization, I committed to pursuing a policy of adaptive regulation. My hope is that we can now go forward to review our broadcast policies and rules to ensure that they effectively further the public interest. I think all of us are concerned that some of our regulations may be tilting the playing field against the continued competitiveness of over-the-air broadcasting. I have mentioned the fact that two AM stations can't be jointly held even though an AM and FM combination can occur. I have mentioned the fact that TV signals cannot overlap at the grade B contour even though a station can be broadcast uh, or distributed by satellite nationwide. So it is these kinds of issues that we will be taking up. As a strong believer in the contribution which broadcasting makes, I want to ensure that we do not impose 
regulations which have the unintended consequence of undermining broadcasting service and competitiveness. The third issue I would like to discuss concerns our plans to accommodate new radio-dependent communications services such as personal communications networks, digital audio radio, and potentially low Earth orbit satellite communications as well. Today, experts are forecasting a world where the individual can receive and place calls virtually any place or time. Using intelligent network features, calls would be routed to the appropriate location through a federation of wireline, satellite, and mobile networks. If we are to accommodate these future communication services, radio frequency management reforms will be needed. Legislation along the lines of the Dingle-Markey uh, initiative will be required. Changes in how the FCC manages use of the non-government spectrum are also in order. Earlier this year, I announced an FCC study to examine the potential to develop a radio frequency reserve, a reserve which would be earmarked specifically to advanced communications technologies. We're now in the process of surveying these bands and determining possible ways to accommodate both current and future services. Finally, Mr. Chairman, let me review our steps to foster U.S. international competitiveness. One such program, begun more than a year ago, involves international communications settlement and accounting rates. All of us have received complaints regarding the high charges for telephone calls incurred by Americans and other allied servicemen serving in the Gulf War. A substantial part of those charges reflects the payments made by MCI, AT&T, and other U.S.-based carriers to the Saudi Telecommunications Administration. Relative to other foreign communications administrations, incidentally, the Saudi Arabian charges are far from the highest. Since the FCC commenced its review of accounting and settlement rates, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, and Japan have announced significant reductions in their accounting rates. Further moves toward more cost-based international calling rates may also be forthcoming. This is an issue which we plan to address later this year. In addition to these efforts, we have also devoted substantial resources to U.S. preparations for the next International Telecommunications Union World Administrative Radio Conference, which is scheduled to convene in Spain in 1992. Nearly two years ago, Mr. Chairman, the FCC established five overriding policy goals. We committed to promoting excellence in American communications, providing effective but adaptive regulation, fostering efficiency, furthering U.S. international competitiveness, and providing timely and efficient service to the public. We have tried to further each of these major goals, and I think in many respects have succeeded. We need to continue our efforts, however, to fulfill our commitment. The reauthorization legislation we have recommended would enable us to do so, and I urge its adoption. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do any other members of the uh, Commission seek recognition at this uh, time for the purpose of making an opening statement? All right, then we'll turn to uh, questions from the uh, subcommittee, and the chair will begin by uh, recognition of uh, himself. Um, the commissioner's uh, decision yesterday in the financial interest in uh, syndication question apparently pleased neither the networks nor the producers. Um, there's one issue on which the independent studios, the major studios, and the networks uh, apparently agree. Uh, the Commission's majority permits the networks to acquire financial interests, domestic syndication rights, and foreign syndication rights in outside productions, but provides that such rights can only be attained in secondary negotiations after the network and producer reach a license fee agreement. Now, the networks are very critical of this provision, stating that it presupposes a level of leverage on the part of the networks that they just don't have. They further assert that by requiring a 30-day waiting period, the Commission has ensured that the networks will never have an opportunity for back-end rights for outside productions. And they're flat out confident of that. The producers, on the other hand, are also critical, albeit for different reasons. 
They suggest that by permitting the networks to negotiate for back-end rights before a program has been scheduled, that you open the door for abuse. They suggest, for example, the following scenario. A producer and a network reach agreement on a show, and as the producer is walking to the door, the network executive says, see you in 31 days, and by the way, we have three open spots on our tentative schedule, Sunday at 7 o'clock, up against 60 minutes, Thursday at 8.30 following the Cosby, and before Cheers, or Saturday at 10.30 following Twin Peaks. The fear, of course, being that where you are scheduled would be a direct consequence of whether you participate and provide the network syndication rights. Some analysts suggest that negotiations for back-end rights should be permitted after the, only after the actual scheduling of the program by a network. Others suggest that the Commission's format for in-house production should have been followed providing for simultaneous negotiations for the show and the syndication rights, but allowing for a 30-day cooling off period before the agreement on back-end rights would be binding. And finally, others suggest that no special protections are warranted. Could you, Mr. Chairman, and then uh, uh, any of the members of the Commission that may have a uh, variation on your uh, position, uh, explain the rationale for the decision which you reached and why you believe it provides sufficient protections for all of the parties who are involved. Well, let me assure you, let me assure you, Mr. Chairman, there will be at least three who will have a variation on my rationale. Uh, so let me uh, first respond. Uh, I believe that uh, that the uh, world of the future and today in television belongs to creative talent. I think that uh, that uh, you know creative, talented. Uh, uh, idea people, writers, uh, producers, directors uh, are really uh, in the strongest position. Uh, there's certainly a lot of evidence in our record uh, that they have used that uh, uh, strength uh, to get uh, better uh, program positions. Uh, uh, as uh, you indicated, that is the placement of the program. Uh, uh, to uh, receive much better license fees, uh, to uh, renegotiate uh, license fees uh, before the contract expired. Uh, and uh, I think that's appropriate strength, uh, and I uh, support uh, that strength. On the other hand, I don't think we should uh, denude the network of uh, the strengths it might have. Uh, the networks uh, are largely uh, distributors. Uh, only uh, Fox has significant uh, entertainment production assets. Uh, the other three networks uh, have only significant uh, uh, creative assets in the news area. Uh, so in my view, uh, we shouldn't uh, strip uh, the, the, the strength that networks have uh, due to what, uh, what assets they have. And I believe that there is essentially a balance and that uh, those negotiations should not go uh, because we have forced them uh, through uh, multi-step uh, processes. Any other uh, members of the Commission that uh, would like to give a perspective on this subject? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I think I go a little farther than the uh, Chairman of the FCC. I think things have changed so drastically since 1970, and even from 1983, when I uh, opposed the networks at the time, that we now have a very open competitive marketplace. And I don't think uh, the government should get involved in these contract negotiations. As far as extraction goes, there are examples of extraction on the part of, of the producers to the networks as well as, the, as any other extraction. And my, my feeling is the extraction might be even uh, greater. And the real power today is, is lies in the people that have the, the the programming and have the writers and have the producers. So I think as far as getting involved in, into contract negotiations in an open competitive market, that should be up to the participants in that, in that market. Commissioner Marshall. 
Well, I clearly have a disagreement with my colleagues here on this issue, and uh, I think it's a, a matter of, I, I agree with them that the network's power overall has diminished greatly. The marketplace is changing. But they still continue to have the, uh, the greatest hold over the na nationwide television audience and uh, thus those who seek to reach it. They still are the uh, conduit through which you have to go as a programmer to make any value for your program. Yes, there are alternatives in cable, but they're not yet the same alternatives as what you have here. The two-step process that was proposed and, and what I supported in the FinCEN decision at least has some means of diminishing the, the ability of the networks to extract rights as a condition of access to the network schedule. The 30-day separation from the license fee time to the secondary negotiation for, for subsequent rights at least ensures it doesn't do what the producers want, and it, it is true that access to the schedule isn't uh, determined until you, you know what the schedule is. That's why the producers say they can always extract until you get to that point. Uh, that, uh, in, in my view, you could at least back it up until the ordering time. Then you know that the network is going to invest in your show. You have an, an order, and you can make, you can sell your secondary rights. On the other hand, the networks, as long as they can extract at some point, and if you separate it by 30 days, then you have an idea of what other people are going to be interested in the value of your show. You have an idea of other potential buyers. This is a 30-day period was, in fact, one of the things that the networks had recommended. They just wanted under a slightly different sequence. And so this way, you're at least mitigating the potential for extraction that I believe still exists because the networks continue to have power diminished though it may be, power over the ability of the program producers and the directors to actually get their shows in the air. Uh, it's quite evident uh, to the subcommittee already the uh, range of uh, disagreement which exists on this uh, issue amongst the uh, uh, commissioners. So I can uh, at this point make quite clear to you that when this item is uh, uh, released, that uh, I intend to very closely scrutinize uh, the, uh, the uh, provisions which are included to ensure that the protections which are put on the books are sufficient to protect all parties and that uh, no unnecessary protections are given to uh, any of the parties involved in any of these uh, negotiations uh, are uh, gratuitously included. And we are going to very closely scrutinize this particular provision in order to make sure that that is the case. Uh, before my time expires, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move on to one other uh, subject, and that is that uh, in June, the Ninth Circuit uh, vacated the Commission's Computer Inquiry 3 decision. The court held that the Commission's decision was unlawfully arbitrary and capricious, pointing to the fact that the Commission's, quote, record yields no support for the Commission's position that market and technological changes since Computer 2 and the box separation order have reduced the danger of cross-subsidization by the Bell operating companies. Despite that court ruling, Mr. Chairman, and other concerns raised by the GAO report about the ability of the FCC's cost allocation rules to control cross-subsidies, this Commission still seems intent on relying upon non-structural approach instead of a separate subsidiary requirement. Could you please Mr. Chairman, explain to the subcommittee your reasons for adhering to the non-structural approach and list those who support this approach other than the Bell Operating Companies, uh, IBM, and the Justice Department. Well, I think the uh, essential reason why the Commission has supported uh, the non-structural approach uh, is the belief that there are uh, benefits uh, to the public uh, from uh, some service uh, integration uh, and that requiring everything uh, 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 to be separated out into, uh, into a separate subsidiary 
uh, denies those benefits. Now, I could go into, uh, into that from the standpoint of services or products or any other category if you wish me to, but I think that's the essence of why we have uh, continued to pursue uh, that uh, uh, alternative. And secondly, we have uh, pursued uh, quite aggressively an open network architecture uh, approach, uh, which uh, the enhanced service providers uh, have applauded. Uh, thirdly, we have pursued quite aggressively a series of, uh, of uh, steps that, uh, that minimize, if not preclude, uh, cross-subsidization, uh, including field audits, attestation audits, a new automated reporting management information system with the benchmarking and comparative data, uh, and, and of course the price caps uh, 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 initiative uh, additionally uh, has a dampening effect on cross subsidization because uh, if you can't uh, if you can't pass your costs on uh, then, then or, or if your costs are capped your prices are capped uh, there's obviously not much in sunny for passing your costs on well my time is expiring mr. chairman I would like to make this point to you however um, the the question of the additional um, information service opportunities, other opportunities which uh, could be granted to the telephone companies is tied very closely to the question of what kinds of safeguards we're going to have in place in order to protect against cross-subsidies, to protect consumers and competitors uh, from behavior uh, which could uh, undermine uh, consumers' confidence and competition in the marketplace. And my own personal belief is that the extent to which you over-rely upon these non-structural safeguards as a means of protecting against abuse uh, makes it very much more difficult than it should be uh, for us to give the serious consideration uh, which it deserves uh, to the question of the grant of additional powers to the uh, telephone companies to move into these areas. And I would advise you very strongly that you should uh, pursue uh, vigorously uh, the avenues of structural safeguards which have to be put in place uh, and have to be proven to be effective uh, if we are to be able to move forward more fully into this uh, uh, era of uh, telecomputers which uh, so many of us uh, believe uh, ultimately is going to be the, the key to the, uh, the future of our country's uh, competitiveness. And uh, I would advise each of you to be wary of the of the subcommittee's concern in this issue area. Uh, my time has expired. Let me turn and recognize the uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Rinaldo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, return to Commissioner Marshall for a moment. You were discussing the ramifications of the 30-day cooling off period. And as I understand it, in its decision yesterday, the Commission adopted the 30-day cooling off period as a safeguard to prevent the networks from extracting rights through a 30-day cooling off period between the negotiation of a license agreement for a program and the negotiation of the financial interests. Now both the producers and the networks have criticized that provision. And my question is as follows. If the 30-day cooling off period expires before the network has committed to schedule a program, what is to prevent a network from simply demanding a financial interest or domestic and foreign syndication rights as a condition of scheduling the show? There's a provision uh, in what we've uh, proposed that says that the networks also have to certify that any acquisition of rights in the secondary negotiation was not made as a condition of airing or ordering of the show. Now, uh, some people will say allowing them to certify that doesn't, it, the, the certification requirement is meant to set up so that they're, that's going to be put in their O&O &O files and then it's, it's subject to uh, challenge if it's not, so that then they would be placed under the requirements of having made a misstatement to the commission, which is a very serious offense by licensees. So that is the enforcement mechanism that we've proposed in this requirement. Okay, I'm, I'm, I know I have limited time, so I want to shift to Chairman Sykes for a minute, and then maybe I'll get back to another question on that same subject. Chairman Sykes, the networks have, uh, I guess, mentioned time and time again, ad infinitum, the competition that they face from cable, from VCRs, and other kinds of video entertainment. 
They've talked about their combined audience shares. It was, they've told how it was 90% in 1979, and we've heard the figure of 60% today over and over again. And this loss of viewership, obviously, is one of the things that leads to a loss of revenue. The revenue loss makes it much more difficult for the networks to continue to provide quality news and public affairs coverage that we all want in this country. Now, I'm sure that in your decision you considered that. Would I be correct in saying that the Commission's action yesterday was designed in part to end that slide economically? Uh, no, I think that would not be correct. I think only the networks can end that slide uh, economically. I think there are powerful forces uh, uh, that, that, that they are trying to move in the teeth of. Uh, and I think they're going to have to take charge of their own economic future. Uh, I do believe that, uh, that the majority plan uh, uh, does give them uh, further opportunity. Uh, but I think at any given juncture, all we can do at the FCC is give them further opportunity. It is not at all clear to me that uh, given this further opportunity, we're going to see a significant difference. In fact, uh, one uh, seasoned observer writing for Time magazine uh, a few weeks ago said that, uh, that uh, I don't know whether it was a he or a she because it was not attributed, believed that, um, that ABC News was now going to be the permanent uh, uh, front runner for all times uh, because the other two principal networks uh, simply didn't have the economics to mount an effective challenge. I, mean, I think we're in an extraordinary new television world. Where, where the patterns of the past, the predictions of the past, uh, are rendered obsolete. Well, do you think uh, yesterday's decision will give the networks more of an opportunity to, uh, as you speak, uh, you said uh, provides them with an opportunity, more of an opportunity to uh, increase that market share or to compete more effectively? I think it will give them an opportunity, yes. Uh, Congressman, could I uh, sure, add absolutely. to the yeah. chairman's statement? Um, I think that we do indeed give uh, the network significant new opportunities here. Uh, but those opportunities are opportunities to lose money in new ventures uh, as well as to make it. It is opportunity to take risks as well as to gain benefits. Um, our primary public policy focus, however, is not only on the future of the networks and the flow of revenues to the networks, but on safeguarding vulnerable parties in this rather special marketplace. Uh, the public interest in diversity has to be balanced also. But I think clearly it was the concern of all the commissioners uh, on both sides of the question uh, that we voted on yesterday to do what we can to give new opportunities to the networks. Let me, uh, if I have time, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to jump back to uh, the chairman and ask him one further question. I mentioned in my opening statement the AT&T dominance proceeding. Can you give the subcommittee an update of uh, the status of that proceeding? Yes, I can. Uh, we are going to, uh, to be concluding this year, uh, assuming that, uh, that the Commission wants to. I mean, I, uh, they're obviously open to, uh, to state a different opinion. Uh, a series of, uh, of questions related to the inter-exchange marketplace, one of which will be the uh, AT&T dominance proceeding, uh, although that's not what I call it because I don't think what we do will uh, end up causing us to change at and status from a dominant to a non-dominant carrier. If that's in the cards, then, uh, then I'd be very surprised. Uh, but I think we'll do that this year. Yesterday we took steps on on a credit card validation, which the uh, other exchange carriers have felt was an important step in helping to uh, balance up uh, competition. Uh, we're going to take steps in what is called the dedicated and uh, versus common transport issue uh, uh, by September, which, uh, uh, which the smaller inter-exchange carriers feel uh, is uh, quite important. Uh, we're going to take steps, I think, probably also in September on what is generally referred to as the 800 number portability question. Uh, again, uh, uh, the other and smaller inter-exchange carriers believe that, uh, that we can help them if we take the right steps. And so we're looking at this not simply as 
you know, what steps to take with respect to AT&T's regulation, whether it is burdensome or less burdensome, because there will always be some regulation, or at least for the foreseeable future. In the upper end market, we're looking at the overall interexchange market and trying to take steps to, to help uh, competition. Okay. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. Um, let me just note that uh, given the range of uh, views which uh, the individuals on the commission uh, represent, that uh, it would probably, probably be advisable uh, for the subcommittee to uh, have uh, uh, more frequent meetings with the uh, commission and to have uh, all of the commissioners before us uh, in the future uh, so that we can uh, capture the uh, diversity of, uh, of opinion which the Commission uh, represents, and uh, we can uh, also have a, uh, a full sense of the, uh, the, uh, the complexity of the issues as you are uh, dealing with them. Let me turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from the State of Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Marshall, yesterday you apparently are quoted as saying that uh, a provision of something that you voted for is probably is a, a toothless guard dog. What did you mean by toothless? And since you're in a majority, what are you going to do to put teeth into something that may only be able to gum the opponent to death? Well, sometimes, sometimes gumming is better than uh, no bite at all. But uh, what uh, I was referring to, again, was our, the process by which we're going to allow the networks to obtain uh, back-end rights in outside productions. And under that process, We've said that first you have to have uh, a licensing agreement, and then 30 days after that, the network may initiate negotiations for acquisition of these secondary rights. And the safeguard there is, one, the 30-day separation, and two, the certification by the network, if it does obtain these secondary rights, that it was obtained without um, conditioning it on the airing or ordering or renewal of the, the program in question. Now, that certification, yes, is a strong safeguard, but on the other hand, uh, who's going to challenge it? If a producer has already succumbed to having had it, something extracted from them, and they're convinced that that's the only way they're going to be able to get on the air, then we're, allowing some, we're, we're relying on someone to challenge something that they've already agreed to in the first place. That's the part of the, 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 the toothlessness that I'm concerned about. I would have preferred to have had you eliminate that if you have the acquisition of those rights occur after the show has been ordered. Once it's been ordered and scheduled, then it couldn't have, the, and then they get the rights, then you don't have to worry about them conditioning access on Isn't that. Isn't that what NTIA suggested? That was precisely what NTIA suggested, and that's what I would have preferred. Unfortunately, as you're in the midst of collective decision making, you don't always get precisely what you would have preferred. It appears that you've turned a two-step process into one long step, uh, a great leap, I guess, uh, someone else may have uh, predicated. I mean, my fear is simply this. If I have a show with, whom, with which I have negotiated a financial interest and a show with whom I have not negotiated a financial interest, which one gets the better program slot? That's a good question. That's the question that the Commission's been wrestling with uh, throughout this process. Uh, when the rules were originally adopted, in 1970, the Commission noted that there was an inherent conflict of interest in uh, being able to obtain the rights in, the, in the sh some shows and then being able to make the decision on scheduling. I'm Doesn't that conflict still exist? That conflict still exists. The network officials will tell you, and in some degrees they're right, that they're so anxious for viewership and so anxious for ratings that if there's a, a, a choice between a show in which they own the rights and a choice between a show that they think is going to be a hit, they're going to put the hit on first. There is some validity to that. And so you have, that's why we've put in these rules a four-year review so we can look and see what's happened in the marketplace since then. My perception is that you know, you're in the middle of a fight between the very wealthy and the really rich. And what you have to do is you have to give a balance of negotiating strengths and I'm, I'm not sure how the, the, this, this, this two-step process achieves an appropriate level of separation in that negotiating process between programming decisions and the acquiring of, uh, of uh, and the negotiations over acquiring a financial interest. 
I guess, uh, uh, Ms. Marshall, uh, uh, Mr. Duggan, perhaps Mr. Barrett, that you know you understand my, my interest. Let me ask Mr. Duggan to comment, if you would like. Uh, yes, sir. I, I think you're right on target. Implicit in the original rules and implicit in the decision of the majority yesterday was that the decision to grant access to the national audience, the precious gift that the networks have to offer, that that gift, that decision should be made on the basis of the quality of the show and not just on the basis of whether the network owns a part of the back end rights. And the only way of ensuring even a shred of hope that that decision will be made on the basis of the quality of the show is to separate the two decisions. Commissioner Marshall and I uh, have been rather strong about that degree of separation. But I think the, the churn about these questions and the incredible complexity uh, confirms uh, a conclusion that I've come to that this is what might be called the Middle East of American communications policy. The tension here is not between... Who's Saddam Hussein? <laughs> well, I'd like to duck that one, Congressman. <laughs> There are no Saddam Husseins. Uh, I've characterized this really as a battle between good guys and good guys. The networks have given tremendous things to the American public. They are the electronic hearth around which the net national family gathers. And the studios and, and the producers have given tremendous gifts. So there are no Saddam Husseins. But there are serious questions like the one that you have raised. The tension is not about which safeguards there will be, however because we, the real tension is created by a significant body of opinion that there should be no safeguards at all. I agree with the chairman that the future belongs to talent and to programmers. But if the talent, if the person who creates the program can't find an audience except on conditions that are onerous, then that talent has nowhere to go. Uh, and no fair return. So and Duggan, this you, you crucial have, question is one that uh, has to be considered. You have the microphone, so I'll let you keep it uh, for purposes of answering this next question. Recently in the last year, you drew an appropriate distinction between potential and actual competition in long distance markets. Recently, the FCC released some statistics which showed that, uh, that there has been an upturn in AT&T's market share uh, what does this mean to you, given the distinction that you tried to draw as recently as, well, within the last year, between actual and potential market concentrations? Congressman, I, I don't want to suggest that I have prejudged this issue, and um, I am I'm very much trying to keep an open mind on this question. Um, but I do think that there is a danger um, in pronouncing robust competition to exist before it truly exists. We have a fragile experiment here in the inter-exchange market of creating genuine competition. Uh, and it, the, in, in the effort to encourage that and to bring forth that, uh, in our own eagerness uh, to, to achieve that, there's always a temptation to announce too soon that it has already been achieved. Um, the time when I made that statement was a time before that upturn. So I think you can imagine um, that my skepticism would probably be somewhat increased um, if AT&T's position uh, became stronger. I think that it is essential that we not pronounce a marketplace competitive until there is a genuine kind of approach to parity. The, the existence of potential, you know, the existence of uh, networks is not enough, it seems to me, to define true competition. I have, Mr. Sykes wants to be heard apparently on that I, I issue. I just want to say, thank you. I, I just want to say that, that, that the only area that we are talking about uh, streamlined regulation is in the higher end area. The statistics that you quote uh, are in the total market, uh, but there is a mixed signal by those statistics. Uh, for example, in the fourth quarter of 1989, AT&T had 63.9 percent of all minutes, and in the fourth quarter of 1990, it had 63.3 percent of all minutes. And so, statistics uh, in this area have been uh, have been massaged, manipulated, and then presented, uh, depending on which uh, side is being uh, is being uh, you know the advocate. Uh, I thank the chairman. Uh, 
Mr. Sykes, I have one other question which I will submit to you in writing, and it relates to uh, the vulnerability of cities to damage suits from cable television companies in attempts to enforce their, uh, enforce their franchises and the threat of monetary damages and claims that they may have to pay. Since I am called away to another hearing, I would like to submit that question to you in writing, and I thank the uh, entire Commission for being here. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me follow up on, a bit on some of the uh, FinCEN uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't have a dog in this fight. Um, my constituents could – it never comes up, believe it or not, at any of my public meetings. Uh, I'm never uh, collared on the streets of Findlay, Ohio, and asked about the FinCEN rules. Matter of fact, that term might even be uh, illegal in Northwest Ohio, I'm not sure. <laughs> But let me, uh, let me quote the uh, gentleman from uh, north of me in Detroit uh, who yesterday said, I think, perhaps the most quotable uh, line uh, during your proceedings. He said, uh, it would be a mistake to characterize the new rule, rules as deregulatory. Calling a majority plan deregulation is like telling an inmate at the end of his jail term that he may leave his cell so long as he does not venture beyond the prison walls. In the case of Finson, the networks have done their time. They deserve to be set free. That was interesting, but it was also particularly interesting that uh, Ms. Marshall uh, responded to that uh, in regard to the networks. We're setting them free, but we're putting them on parole. Um, that perhaps uh, crystallizes uh, the, uh, the regulatory versus uh, non-regulatory uh, uh, areas that we're, that, we're, uh, that we're talking about and that you uh, dealt with. Let me first of all start with you, uh, Mr. Coelho, and say that, and just ask you, uh, that, for, uh, that what, will this, what will this decision, first of all, mean uh, to my constituents, if anything? And uh, if it does, in fact, uh, affect them, when will they uh, first uh, be aware of it? Well, uh, I've made in my statement that I tend to favor uh, any kind of a, uh, a decision that will maintain free over-the-air television. I can certainly believe that it's threatened. Um, as far as the constituents are concerned, more and more now, between cable and VCRs and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> oncoming uh, satellite, the network audience has eroded to, to a, a, a point where there's no comparison with the network today's power with 1970. Now, in my opinion, the record of their hearing just overwhelmingly calls for repeal of the entire rules. Now, it, it, I say this, the, the networks are going to testify for their own uh, behalf. The studios are going to testify for their own behalf. The independent stations on their own behalf. But if we take disinterested people, those that don't have a financial interest, and say, how do you feel about this thing? The Justice Department that was responsible for the consent decree says complete repeal. FTC uh, repeal. 14 unions. Afraid of free over the air television threat, 14 unions repeal. Uh, leading uh, public interest groups and public interest attorneys like Henry Geller, probably the leading uh, public interest lawyer in, in, in the city, and who represents uh, not only the Markle Foundation, but he represents a, the, uh, a, a senior citizens council, uh, the black media for fair media, uh, complete repeal. Before, I've never seen the press, responsible press, uh, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Broadcasting Magazine, Business Week. I've never seen anything like it. All of it, it wasn't there eight years ago, favoring repeal. It's time to come at, uh, to, to, to help the networks out because free over the air TV is, is uh, threatened. Ms. Marshall, let me ask you this. Um, parole connotes some kind of uh, wrongdoing in the, in the past, uh, and perhaps you might have chosen a different term under different circumstances. I'm wondering if uh, you might want to bail yourself out a bit uh, in that regard. Uh, actually, I'm not sure that I, I need to bail myself out. I think the fact that they had to sign consent decrees back in the 70s uh, uh, with respect to antitrust violations evidences that there was some misconduct of some sort that, that went on at that time. I wouldn't suggest that they are in, in, engaging in any misconduct now. But given the power that they had and, and the record that was uh, 
based on which the rules were adopted in 1970, there was a record that the, that the uh, networks had extracted financial interest in syndication rights from program producers uh, when, they, when there weren't safeguards and when there was a, a total free-for-all. What we've done with these rules is to allow them, to, to allow the networks significant opportunities to participate in the program production marketplace directly and indirectly in foreign and domestic distribution. These are liberties that they haven't had for the last 20 years. What's and, that going to mean I, to my constituents? What it's, what it's going to mean to your constituents is if we had abolished the rules, then I believe what your constituents would have seen would be a, a lack of diversity, much less differentiation in television than what they see now. With these rules, your constituents probably won't see much difference un unless they see an increased, uh, an increase in the continuation of the high quality entertainment programming that the American public is, is used to seeing. With these, with these changes in the rules, as we've expanded the network's opportunities, they'll have more money to invest, they'll be able to put in more shows, they'll be able to compete more with cable. So, so those sorts of things, your, your constituents probably won't know the difference other than they're going to see more of the kind of entertainment programming that they'd like to see. Without the rules, they wouldn't have. Had you voted, though, with Mr. Quello and the chairman, what effect would that, it seems to me that, that they would even have more diversity and more ability to get the news and information uh, with the outright repeal of the rule as opposed to going uh, part of the way. How, did, how well, would you answer that? I was, I was trying to make it clear before. If, in my view, if we had voted for phased-in repeal of the rules or total repeal of the rules, then the very diversity that the FCC has sworn to promote that's part of our statutory mandate would have greatly diminished if not disappeared. The independent television stations who bring on different broadcasting uh, and, and compete with the markets, compete with the network shows directly, would have not had the safeguards that we wanted to have with respect to affiliate favoritism and warehousing and domestic syndication marketplace. The independent producers who bring uh, minority involvement, bring in a diversity of views to the American public with the shows that they present would not be available because they would be, their rights would be being extracted. I see my time's expired. Gentlemen's time uh, has expired. And as we come back over to the Democratic side, I would note to my uh, Democratic colleagues that the uh, full committee chairman uh, has arrived. And uh, without uh, objection, what I would like to be able to do is that rather than now recognizing um, the other Democrats who have arrived uh, a little bit earlier in deference to the full committee chairman, um, and uh, his uh, uh, other very heavy uh, schedule this morning. I would like to recognize him at this point out of order uh, for as much time as he may consume. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy to me. Uh, we have a hearing going on upstairs in the Oversight Subcommittee on Bottled Water and its Safety, and for that reason I will have to return quickly. I want to express my thanks again to you, Mr. Chairman, and to my colleagues on the committee for this courtesy given me. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that, that I be permitted to insert into the record an opening statement at the appropriate place and fashion. I have a number of questions I would like to direct to the Commission as they pertain to yesterday's decision to revise the financial interest in syndication rules. First questions are for Chairman Sykes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in your dissenting statement, you made this comment. A draft report and order does not exist. If no draft report and order existed, can you tell us on what did the Commission vote on yesterday morning? On yesterday morning? Well, essentially there was an executive summary uh, that the Commission voted on uh, that I think was approximately 20 or 25 pages in length. Uh, is, is this a usual practice, Mr. Chairman? No. Uh, it, what is the usual practice? Well, the usual practice is that uh, the bureaus uh, prepare uh, uh, reports in order, draft reports in order uh, that are complete, uh, and those are then presented uh, to the commission, uh, and then it's, uh, uh, you know, debate, uh, attempt to reconcile uh, varying points of view uh, uh, center around that document. When did you receive the, co the copy? of the proposal that was approved by the Commission on Tuesday morning? On Monday. On Monday. Now, I, it was not available to you then on Friday? I don't think the longer version was. I think their late Friday uh, uh, evening there was a, a five-page version, uh, about 8 o'clock or so. I don't know precisely the time because I had left the Commission. Now, the uh, 
general practice of the courts in reviewing matters uh, where they go on appeal from the commission to the courts uh, would require that the that the action of the courts or rather that the action of the commission be supported by the uh, record uh, can you tell me whether there were citations in in this document uh, to the record in support of the, of the conclusions which it contained well I, I uh, uh think there were references uh, to, to the record. I don't recall specifically uh, uh, footnote citations to the record. I see. Now, uh, Commissioner Barrett, can you tell us why the draft order and report circulated for approval um, were not followed, uh, not following the usual procedures of the, of the commission? Probably because of um, my concern about the foreign syndication part and we were struggling with that, and I could not justify not allowing American companies to be in foreign syndication, and we had some lively discussion about that, and I simply was not going to support anything that, didn't, that did not allow the companies to get into that area. As a result, we did not finish it uh, uh, on time, uh, and we started I guess discussing that probably early in the afternoon, and we did not reach any kind of agreement on that till probably around 6.30 or 6 o'clock. Now, there were other issues, however, which could have been footnoted, were there not? There were other, Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear you. I say there were other issues, however, which could have been footnoted in conformity with the usual practices of the Commission, were there not? Yes, you're correct. Why were those not footnoted? They were not maybe because of, as a matter of time, and as I suggested, the only sticking point that, 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 that I had at this point, Mr. Chairman, was the foreign syndication. And I did not realize that that was going to become an issue of this nature at that time. Now, um, can you tell me um, then uh, <coughs> When was the item that was circulated on Friday night or Saturday morning prepared for distribution to the other commissioners? The item had been prepared some weeks ago. The only difference between that item, I think, and the uh, item that finally came out was the so-called two-step, if I may, and a, a few changes here and there, which I, ca I cannot go into details about. And, and my concern, we inserted the, the foreign syndication aspect. Those were the major two changes, Mr. Chairman, the two-step and the foreign syndication uh, aspect. And that was given to the parties, I think, on Friday night or Saturday morning in some cases. Now, during the week that preceded the decision of the commission, were you available here in Washington for consultation with the other commissioners to discuss the contents of the proposal? The week before, yes, I was, with the exception of uh, one day. One day. Well, two days, I'm sorry. I was in uh, giving a speech. Um, we've received commission that several other commissioners, rather information that several other commissioners, including some who supported your proposal, expressed frustration that you were unavailable to discuss your proposal as late as Friday afternoon. In the light of this situation, would you please provide the subcommittee with these materials? One, your schedule for the week beginning at noon on Tuesday, April 2, and ending at noon on April 9. Two, a list of the dates and times of all conversations that you had with your fellow commissioners concerning the resolution of this issue during the week of April 2 to 9. Three, a list of the times that you were in your office and available for consultation with other commissioners during that week. And I would ask, Mr. Chairman, that, that, a, uh, that, that the other four commissioners um, provide us a response to those questions. Uh, and I ask that they be inserted in the record at the appropriate place. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have these questions for Commissioner Duggan. <coughs> Commissioner, it is my understanding that on Tuesday, April 2, the Commission issued its sunshine notice that indicated that the FISR matter would be decided on April 9 and that certain restrictions known as ex parte restrictions would apply between the time the notice was released and the time that the Commission really reached its decision. Is this in comport with your understanding? Yes, sir. Now, Commissioner, 
Would you explain to the committee your understanding of the prohibitions contained in the Commission's rules? They are essentially, Mr. Chairman, that we cannot talk with parties at interest uh, on any subject that would affect the outcome. Now, the text of the Commission's rules uh, regarding ex parte communications, which I ask be made part of the record, at part 1.1202, parenthesis A, close parenthesis, defines presentation as, and I now quote, any communication directed to the merits or outcome of a proceeding, close quote. And then part 1.1202, parenthesis B, close parenthesis, defines ex parte presentation as, and I now read, any presentation made to decision-making personnel, but in restricted proceedings, any presentation to or from decision-making personnel which, uh, and then I skip some, says, if oral, is made without advance notice to the parties to the proceedings and without opportunity for them to be present, close quote. Now, I have here before me a copy of an article which appeared in the New York Times, dated Saturday, April 6, 1991. I asked that a copy of this article be put in the record, and it is titled, Agreement Reached on TV Reruns. It contains materials of the proposal circulated Friday night, uh, which was ultimately adopted by the Commission yesterday. Uh, Commissioner, are you familiar with the article? Yes, I am. Now, it's an interesting article. It starts out with three paragraphs describing the proposal that Chairman Sykes found in his office at noon on Saturday. It then has a single paragraph of background, then a quote, which is from you. It says as follows, I am confident that we have an agreement that can gain a broader consensus than the original Barrett plan, said Commissioner, as said Irvin S. Dugan, one of the three commissioners who supported an earlier proposal drafted by Andrew C. Barrett in a telephone interview from his home. But he added that the plan could be changed slightly to win the support of FCC Chairman Alfred C. Sykes and another, and another Commissioner, James H. Quello. Now my question, given the Commission's rules regarding ex, ex parte communications, uh, I find myself wondering how your role in providing information to this reporter on the outcome of the Commission's decision is not a violation of the Commission's rules. Uh, would you explain to us how this is not a violation of the Commission's rules uh, and and give me some reason to feel that Yes, that Mr. You Chairman. Um, when I arrived here? home at about uh, 8.30 on uh, Saturday evening, the telephone was ringing. I picked it up and found myself in conversation with a reporter from the New York Times asking me questions about what was happening. I said that I was not able to give him any details, that as far as I knew, the thing had just come out of the typewriter and that I would not... Uh, be able to discuss it, and I said, uh, two of the commissioners, uh, Chairman Sykes and Mr. Quello, have probably not even seen it yet. And uh, he said, well, I understand it's a compromise proposal, and I said, I'm confident that, you know, there's a chance of such an outcome, but I cannot discuss the details. Um, and I think he took the quote from that conversation in which I was struggling to end the conversation and not give him any details. And so I think what we have is a kind of feeding frenzy of the press, so that that one sentence, uh, which I did not consider to be substantive or to concern any details of the uh, thing, uh, simply was taken by him. I think he subsequently called Commissioner Quello, and Commissioner Quello got the impression uh, that he had details. He told Commissioner Quello that he'd been talking to me. Uh, he didn't tell Commissioner Quello that uh, the only conversation he had me with me was an effort, you know, uh, a brief one in which I tried to extricate myself from the conversation. And he, I, I think an effort was made to lead Commissioner Quello the next day into a discussion uh, based on the misapprehension that he had somehow gotten details from me. I regret that conversation, but the only quote that he uh, got was in an effort to uh, draw back. The, the few conversations in which I made was quoted never went to the substance of the document, Mr. Chairman. Never went to the details, but only said, uh, we are working to get a compromise, which I think was generally known. The um, language of the rule says, refers to presentation as any communication directed to the merits or outcome of a proceeding. That's right. If there, if there has been a violation, sir, I deeply regret it, and uh, it, was, it was through no intent to make a violation, and I don't think there was any substance uh, discussed here. I just asked 
Would you would you furnish any additional comments you deem appropriate for the record, please, Commissioner? Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, it appears here that the reporter got his story on Friday. Chairman Sykes testified that the memorandum was not available until his staff, or rather, to his staff until Saturday at noon. Um, I'm I'm curious, Commissioner. Do you want to give me some some comments on? how this works out in terms of seeing to it that the that all the commission has available to it the information before the before it gets to the press either either mr sykes or or or, or commissioner duggan well i i don't uh, know the details of uh, what led up uh, other than what i uh, have heard uh, certainly, uh, you know, as a part of our uh, routine pattern at the FCC, this does not happen. Mr. Chairman, I think it is fair to say that as in every government agency, uh, certainly in every government agency I've ever worked in, we have a serious problem of information leaking from the building. Various parties do possess copies of documents, and a certain amount of leaking does go on. And then what we have is a kind of press feeding frenzy in which people are called by members of the press uh, who already have information. And I think that this business of leaking is one that plagues every member of the commission. Um, I have found that every memo, virtually every communication I've ever sent to a fellow commissioner has ended up in the press in some way within 48 hours. And I think we do indeed have a serious problem, and I think you're right to raise it. Now, the, I, have, I have some curiosities. Commissioner Barrett, I think, has properly been concerned about the foreign trade aspects of this matter, which have been a matter of special concern to uh, me here. Uh, I'd, I'd like to go into some questions with regard to this, either with Mr. Barrett or such other members of the Commission might want to comment. Uh, Let's talk about this from the impact of, its, uh, of, of the decision on foreign trade. Um, does the rule adopted yesterday give preference to U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies over U.S. companies in the, in, in the same marketplace? I'm not sure I can answer that question, Mr. Chairman, and I'm not sure what the normal restrictions are presently in many of the European countries. I am not particularly uh, uh, educated on what is going to happen in EC92. I guess my concern was more general in that, as I told my colleagues, it was the most agonizing part of that order, that, uh, uh, that uh, decision to make, because I could not justify on any economic basic or any economic principle uh, or any public interest for the American public how I could keep American companies out of uh, foreign syndication or foreign markets. Whether, wh what the rules are presently, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. I, I have some familiarity with what, import, what imports are allowed, but in terms of what they will be in EC 1992 or what they are presently, I just can't answer that, Mr. Chairman. Let's, let's, let's look at them. Does the rule require U.S. networks to wait for 30 days before they can acquire foreign distribution rights from, proceed from producers? Yes, yes it does, and I guess that's the reason I hesitated, Mr. Chairman, I guess that was one of the things that I reached a consensus on that I was not that comfortable with, okay. but, but I wanted the foreign syndications that much that I you know, so, so I, I note then that, uh, that, that the, the next question is, do U.S. subsidiaries of foreign countries have to, or foreign companies have to wait for 30 days? That's what? Do U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies have to wait for 30 days? No, I, I guess they don't, Mr. Chairman, but I guess that is something that is not within the mandate of the commission. Uh, can, you, can you tell me why? Well, I think that there are, we have a trade representative, we have the Department of Commerce, and, and, I, and we have your body here, and it seems to me that if there are, are matters uh, of trade interest, they ought to be somewhere else and not necessarily before the Commission. I think there are other principles that apply 
uh, in addition to what we can do at the Commission. Uh, are you telling me then that you're precluded from treating, from treating uh, foreign subsidiaries, uh, uh, foreign, yeah, U.S. subsidiaries of foreign services, uh, foreign companies differently than uh, U.S. Uh, networks? No, I guess in the broadcast area, as you well know, they certainly are not allowed in, into the business. But oh. for example, uh, 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 I did, we did not have that much control. Whether or not CBS sold Sony to the Japanese, we did not have that much to do with that. I wasn't here at that time. I understand. What we do in terms of uh, people selling property that may be owned by the networks, we don't have that much to do with. So, so you are not precluded from treating the networks the same as foreign subsidiaries. Uh, oh no, no, no. I'm as sorry. As I didn't subsidiaries understand. Subsidiaries of foreign companies. You're right. You're absolutely right. Okay. Now, can a uh, foreign television network enter an agreement with an American producer to acquire both the foreign distribution rights and the American distribution rights at the same time? Yes. Let's, let's say BBC. Uh, now, uh, does it have to wait out the 30 days? No, and, and, and I guess my uncomfortability is you're asking me about the 30 days, Mr. Chairman, well, and that, that was an area that I was not particularly comfortable with and agreeing to, but I did so because of the foreign syndication market that I wanted. I want it clear. I'm just trying to understand, yeah, I understand. What, what you have done yeah. here, Commissioner. Now, would a, would a studio which is owned by a foreign company, uh, which is a, essentially a U.S. subsidiary, uh, be required to wait that 30 days before it negotiates syndication uh, rights? No. Which is it, four it, it of the could, seven, it I think. It could come in then and commence negotiating these syndication rights uh, while the network has to wait, could it not? Yes, you're correct. Now, uh, are foreign companies or studios owned by foreign companies in any way restricted in the negotiation with American program producers or for the acquisition of American distribution rights to the programs under the under the projected rule? No, that no, they're not, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman. No. I had to think about that. I, I'm I'm willing to have you say yes or no, whichever. No, no, they're not. Okay. Now, can a foreign company or a studio owned by a foreign company? produce nine hours per week of the prime time entertainment schedule on any one network? Yes, they can. Can they do that on more than one of the networks? I would think so. They could? Yes. As a matter of fact, they could produce the full 36 hours by going to uh, all, of the, all of the three networks in Fox? Yeah. Yes, I, they, they, they can, Mr. Chairman, but I'm not sure that that's likely to, to occur, but you're absolutely right, they can. I see. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a number of other questions that, that uh, I would like to uh, ask at an appropriate time, including some about the 22-hour uh, prime time schedule. As a matter of fact, I'd like to ask that at this time. I note here we have a standard 22-hour prime time schedule. Now, the provision will permit networks to produce 8.8 .8 hours or 8 hours and 48 minutes of programming a week. Is that right? Yes. Um, I'm curious. I've never seen a 48-hour block of time listed in the TV guide. Well, it's... What, what, or 40, I've said 48 minute. I said 48 hours. What, we, what we did, Mr. Chairman, and, and I, I guess that some of it is, while not necessarily arbitrary is all on the record. We made a decision that there was a range in which we could operate and that is the range in which we made that decision. Does the record support that? Yes it does. And we will, we will, and I, I will, I will, I will indicate to you where the record does support that. Uh, 48 minutes is supported. 48 minutes? Yes. I'm not sure that 48 minutes, I don't know where you get to 48 minutes from. Well, it's, I, I, multiply, I multiply the time uh, by the, by the, by the uh, necessary uh, component that the Commission has used. And that comes out at 8 hours and 48 minutes, or 8.8 .8 hours. 
And I, I had I had not considered eight point. I, I I'd always considered eight point five, but I will find out whether or not the eight po the forty eight minutes is justifiable, Mr. Chairman. Does the record support that? The record would minutes? because it supports eight point five, Mr. Chairman. Point supports eight point five. Very well. Mr. Chairman, you've been very generous to me. I thank you and I thank the members of the Commission for their courtesy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before you leave, I'd like to make uh, just a brief clarification. The General Counsel of the FCC has advised me that according to the non-disclosure laws that were in discussion earlier... I beg pardon? Uh, the General Counsel of the FCC has just advised me that according to our non-disclosure laws, which you discussed with me earlier, if no disclosure of substance is made, there is no violation of the ex parte or the non-disclosure laws. So my, uh, I, I'm curious. The article has a great deal of substance. It did not come from me, sir. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired, and we uh, thank the chairman for his uh, participation uh, today. Uh, let us now turn to uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from the state of uh, Alabama, uh, Mr. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Sykes, you touched briefly on the question of fees in the uh, budget proposal, and I'd like to, to discuss that a little bit with you. The budget from OMB for 92 contains a directive to increase, and uh, I quote, existing licensing and service fees from commercial users. Now, given that mandate, uh, existing fees on commercial users, why, sir, do, do you recommend to, to expand fees that include public and amateur broadcasters who do not pay such fees now, and of course would not be existing, and by definition are non-commercial? Uh, excuse me. Uh, the uh, uh, authority that I understood uh, or, or, or the, the delegation that I understood we had from OMB, which of course put forward the budget, uh, was to construct a fee schedule that spanned both commercial and non-commercial services. Well, I would point out uh, in the budget document, uh, part 3-11, uh, where it uh, says the Federal Communications Commission increase fees uh, excuse me, increase existing licensing and service fees from commercial users. Mm -hmm. A portion of this increase would be dedicated to the expansion of FEC services. Congressman, I'm told by our uh, managing director that that uh, is a summary from what you are reading and that the detail is not as confining. <clears throat> well, it breaks it down into discretionary and to mandatory. Uh, the discretionary being not covered by the Budget Act. Uh, well, there's no way, whether it's a, uh, a summary or whether it's a full uh, statement, uh, can you uh, uh, derive uh, people that are not covered? Uh, they couldn't be existing if they were not paying fees beforehand. Is that they, correct? They couldn't, excuse me, I'm... They would not be existing because they had not been paying fees beforehand. That's right. Uh, the amateur service you referred to had not been paying fees beforehand. Well, in the case of public He's television and radio, which are in part funded with taxpayers' dollars through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, doesn't assessing a user fee uh, in effect rob Peter to pay Paul? Well, you know, what we have tried to do is, is base our fees on cost uh, of service. Uh, but I would certainly invite uh, uh, the Congress, if it prefers to change the distribution, to do so. Well, I, <clears throat> I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, another thing that I'm especially concerned about would be the impact of these fees on rural America, rural Alabama, which is already underserved. Uh, wouldn't assessing a user fee on public television and public radio act as a disincentive to the creation of new stations to serve rural areas or to place trans, uh, translators or boosters to reach these areas? You know, my, uh, uh, is that radio and TV? You know, I'm told it's $100 on, on non-commercial television. Uh, that's, that's a minimum. 
of $100, uh, isn't it? Well, I don't think there were minimums and maximums in respect to non-commercial television. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a range on some services. Uh, for example, a daytime AM station would not be charged as much of a fee as a 100,000 watt FM station. But again, we're, we're looking for that particular fee schedule. And then I'll report uh, if there is. Uh, it's $100. It's $100, um, and, and I'm now reading from what we provided uh, to OMB and uh, the committee, uh, non-commercial uh, educational FM is $100. Uh, then you skip down to TV, non-commercial is $100, uh, and, and there, there is no range. So that would be both a minimum and a maximum. The minimum actually was on mass. Uh, mass Mass media bureau fees, I think, is where the $100 minimum that I had in mind. Well, public broadcasters then would compete for scarce dollars or funding to continue, uh, uh, in my opinion, their excellent mission of providing educational programming and entertainment. Uh, ham operators uh, who willingly step in to serve it in times of national emergency. Uh, doesn't a blanket minimum fee ignore an ability to pay such a fee? And in the case of public TV and radio uh, stations and ham operators, ignore the important public policy objectives which these users serve? Well, one of the reasons, uh, Congressman, that we're asking that uh, the authorizing committee uh, authorize these fees is because uh, in our development of the fee schedule, we tried to take into account uh, more than just simple cost causation uh, factors. Uh, so we took into account uh, commercial versus non-commercial. Uh, in the case, for example, of amateurs, I think it's a $35 fee uh, to span a 10-year license period, which would be $3.50 a year. Uh, but generally, uh, uh, Congressman, what we recommended, uh, we do not believe would in any uh, respects defeat uh, the service or or, uh, you know, hobble uh, the provider? Well, regardless of the fact whether it's a lot of money to, to you or to other people, uh, increasing uh, existing licensing and service fees uh, from commercial users that was the mandate uh, to the commission from OMB, uh, you've actually gone beyond that by uh, uh, going into the field of public radio and television and ham operators, though, haven't you, sir? If you, if you will allow me, Congressman, I'd like to submit for the record uh, the detail of uh, our instruction from OMB to clarify that we didn't uh, uh, proceed uh, in a way other than in compliance with the direction that we had. All right, sir, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time is up. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize the uh, ranking minority member for the full committee. The gentleman from the uh, state of uh, New York, Mr. Lent, uh, with, the, with the notation that he, he is recognized with the approbation of the other minority members, so I've graciously consented I, to I allow thank, you to uh, particularly my colleague from California for uh, uh, ceding his time to me so that I can get in and get out, because I have a number of other hearings as well. Uh, I'd like to ask the, uh, the panel about this FinCEN decision, not the merits, but something a little bit different. According to some of the uh, press reports that I've seen, the FinCEN decision has created uh, what we might call a fractious FCC. And some have uh, even questioned the long-term internal impact of the decision. And I'd like to give each of you uh, just uh, 30 seconds or a minute to clear the air an opportunity uh, to explain whether you feel that this decision has impaired your working relationships and the comedy that uh, formerly existed in the FCC. And we start with the chairman. Well, I think only time will tell. I I'm optimistic uh, that uh, there has been no permanent fracture. I think the participants in this proceeding spent uh, millions of dollars to destabilize the FCC. I think to a degree they accomplished that. I think it was a short-term uh, uh, accomplishment. I don't think it will have long-term implications. 
Anyone else like to comment? I'd like very much to comment, sir. Um, I think that we have to start from the realization that in every institution, be it the Supreme Court or the FCC or the Congress, where decisions are made by vote, that debate, contention, division, I mean division along the lines of votes, are built into the process and are in fact intended by the founders. What we hope is that robust debate, that division, that contention, the crucible of decision making in a democracy, that the debate can be kept within civil and courteous bounds. I would like to say that I do not believe that on the great bulk of the work that we do, the contention and the debate exceed the bounds of civility. Uh, I have found the chairman from my first day of meeting him to be courteous and civil and collegial and a person of Im in immense integrity. And I said to him the first time we met, uh, I said, Mr. Chairman, you and I are going to have real differences, and I want us to have a relationship that is friendly enough to survive those differences. And I think that sort of uh, civility and collegiality will be familiar to the effort that you try to make here. I am convinced that collegiality and civility will survive, and I don't think that anyone should uh, conclude that just because the debate in these 1% or 2% of very contentious proceedings where there are sometimes real uh, differences of opinion, do not conclude from that that we are paralyzed or fractured. Uh, simply conclude that spirited, determined, uh, robustly <laughs> debating commissioners are I don't want to cut you off, but I, I get the picture uh, from your point of view. Does any, uh, I think you've said it all. Does anyone else uh, want to comment on that or add anything to it? Congressman, I've been here longer than anyone, and I've, I've seen some, some very heated uh, uh, debates and uh, arguments in commissions before this. This happens to be the most highly publicized and the most controversial case we've ever had in 17 years at the commission. And I think... Okay, well, I, I think we can, uh, as politicians, can appreciate that. We've had some 21 to 20 uh, votes here and uh, from time to time and some contention. and. And uh, so I, I feel better uh, hearing that uh, sentiment expressed unanimously across the board. Now, on the merits of that decision, what uh, Commissioner Coelho uh, seemed earlier to make a very good point that the <laughs> Department of Justice, the FTC, various unions, economists, newspapers, all urged across the board repeal of the uh, FinCEN rules. Uh, can the commissioners, particularly those who, uh, who uh, came up with the decision yesterday, point to uh, any kind of an abundance of support for the decision that was reached uh, yesterday? Uh, Commissioner Dugan talked about robust debate. Actually, uh, I think when you were going to meet back on March the 14th uh, to make the decision, uh, the Department of Justice got a hold of you and uh, pulled you back and said there hadn't really been enough time for public comment on the, uh, on the uh, proposal advanced by <laughs> Commissioner Barrett. Can you, uh, can you point to uh, those of you who supported the majority position yesterday an abundance of support or anything in the record to uh, justify the decision that was made? First of all, the decision was based entirely on the record. I, for one, and I don't think any of my colleagues would, would support anything that was not on the record, and it had four basic policy goals, one of achieving diversity, one of taking a look at global competitiveness, one making sure that there was some movement for so-called emerging networks, if I may, and to make sure that those rules were clear and, and enforceable. And I think Commissioner Quello makes a very good point. Certainly there were various parties that presented their point of views, but he mentioned too the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal that had an economic interest. They happened on television station and broadcast senators. So they, they never bothered to make that very, I mean Washington Post, they, did, they didn't bother to make that very clear. So there was diverse interest. Well, but I think there, well, there, 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 uh, there, Commissioner Barrett, if I could just break in, you said one of your points was the fo foreign competitiveness was one of the justifications. Global competitiveness. Global competitiveness. 
uh, was one of your justifications. I thought that Chairman Dingell's uh, questions regarding uh, foreign companies seemed to demonstrate, at least as I heard the questions, that yesterday's decision is going to uh, help companies like uh, Matsushita and Sony and BBC and other foreign competitors of uh, American networks. I, I think, Mr. Congressman, the point that you need to, uh, we need to consider is that prior to last week, there was no ability for foreign syndication. And I think Chairman Deagle's points are well taken by me, but I think also they have the ability to, to, to syndicate in foreign markets. And so it, there, there is some aspect that addresses that foreign competitive question. Congressman, if I could yes. interject here as well. I, I would note that it seems that we're mixing apples and oranges somewhat, too, because the foreign-owned subsidiaries are precluded by our laws from being engaged in uh, being networks, owning broadcast stations, being distributors of the product. And the restrictions that we have put on the networks, the restrictions that we've retained with respect to the networks, are a direct result of their unique positions as gatekeepers to a national audience. And so the distinction is, is, is somewhat lost as if you want to compare the two things together that way. Okay, now I just want to switch over to the subject of cable uh, re-regulation. You, of course, all know that we've been receiving uh, increasing consumer complaints here in the Congress. Legislation has been introduced in the last two Congresses to regulate the cable industry, which was essentially deregulated under the 1984 Cable Act. Uh, the FCC has initiated a proceeding to redefine the standard under which effective competition exists for a cable system within any community. As I understand it, currently, if a cable community has three over-the-air broadcast signals that are unduplicated, then effective competition, quote-unquote, is deemed to exist, and local authorities are prohibited from regulating cable rates. Uh, my question is, do you, uh, without getting into how you're going to decide, because that's none of our business, but do you anticipate completing your effective competition proceeding soon? And could you give us uh, perhaps some direction, some indication of the direction you may be going in with respect to uh, reviewing the existing three signal standard? Yes, we intend to do it soon. My hope we can do it in May, and I think each of my colleagues concur with that. Uh, I think the direction will clearly be to enlarge the definition of what is effective competition. Uh, I think it's unclear how we'll come out. I thank the uh, panel very much. Mr. Chairman, thank you. The gentleman's time has uh, expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from the state of New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Uh, Commissioner Marshall, uh, you may have heard my uh, opening statements about uh, the disadvantaged position uh, that smaller independent producers might have under this new regulatory uh, structure. And I wonder if you basically agree with that view. Well, I, I do agree uh, uh, somewhat. We, I think we've ameliorated some of the disadvantages. That's why I uh, went ahead and supported our recommendations, but the concern that I have is that the people who are the very least capable of standing up to an extraction of their rights uh, are the independent producers, the, the beginning producers, and under this uh, extraction proofing safeguard mechanism that we've put in place, they still will be subject to, uh, first of all, the, the sale of foreign rights will be available much earlier in the process that they can purchase the foreign rights of the things that keep them in business. The, the, the foreign rights are the things that they sell those off so that they can finance themselves. And if the extraction proofing safeguard is not sufficient to protect them, then you're going to, then the independent producers are going to be out of business. Now, uh, the 30-day rule, do you, do you share the view? I'm a little confused about your position because you had answered to, to both Congressman Markey and Rinaldo that you felt uh, uh, that the 30-day waiting period was uh, sufficient protection for producers, yet you were quoted here, uh, we have mitigated but not uh, fail-safe the risk that such rights will be extracted as a condition of access to the network schedule. 
but it may be like having the fox certify that the chickens are safe under the chicken coop. Uh, think about it, who's going to challenge the network certification, end of quote. Now, is that consistent with what you... That is consistent. Um, I, some some uh, protection's better than none at all. Those were, those were my choices. Okay. Uh, basically, when you're involved in a collective decision-making process, you have to go with that. The con we do have some safeguarding mechanism, and that is it's not just the 30-day separation. It's also the requirement that the network certify that the acquisition of the rights has not been a conditioning of airing or renewal or of ordering. On the other hand, uh, again, as, as I've said with you and, and I discussed uh, earlier, the, um, you're going to be relying on the very producer that uh, gave away those rights as a condition to access the network as being the one that complains about that. It's, it's uh, not necessarily the best of situations. Well, I, I'm obviously, uh, you have a huge uh, studio interest. You have uh, large networks. I expressing my concern in this decision for the small independent minority producer, and, and I'm, I'm somewhat uh, concerned about the implications of this decision. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Commissioner Barrett, uh, on the foreign resale rights, uh, this is a significant concession to the networks, is it not? What, what kind of money are we talking about? And is, is it accurate to say that you might have uh, the studios literally, uh, literally beholden to, to the network on, uh, on possibly even the substance uh, of, of the resale provisions. Is that, is that a fear? Or? Uh, well, Congressman Rich and I think, uh, Richardson, I think you're absolutely right. It, it's in a large amount of money. I'm not sure how much. My dilemma came in that in this proceeding, the, probably the reason nobody is, un, uh, nobody is happy today is that everybody wanted to be made whole and to, be, to maintain a level of happiness. In this kind of proceeding, there are always losers. Everybody cannot win. My dilemma with the, financial, with the foreign syndication aspect came is that I could not honestly come up with any application of any economic principle that would allow me to feel good about saying American communists could not get into foreign syndication. There's absolutely no question there are some uh, adverse impacts on people. But if you were to, 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 to not have any, uh, you know, then I guess you would have left them the way they were. You no, have not made any I, movement. I understand. No, I, I understand your, your answer. I just, everybody here is crying that uh, the commission uh, ruined them. You know, everybody is, both sides are, and I'm... I, I would suggest, you're right, and I would suggest to you, uh, probably Commissioner Quello, I probably, we probably accidentally did what he once said. He'd like to have something that everybody would be unhappy with, and we certainly have done that, but I would, I would think if you'd read what the analysts on Wall Street are saying this morning, is that everybody's not doing that bad. Now, on the 30-day, uh, perhaps the Chairman Sykes, and I know you... You may not share this view, but on the 30-day uh, waiting provision, uh, would you say that uh, the networks are justified in saying and claiming that uh, they are disadvantaged, uh, that in that 30 intervening day a major studio has a competitive advantage? Would you uh, basically uh, agree with that rule? And if so, why? What are we? Are there are there meetings that can take place in 30 days that can't happen? In, in 60 days, uh, where you have millions of dollars involved? Yes, I think that I think the networks are uh, correct in claiming that, uh, and uh, uh, so I didn't support it. Uh, but I didn't support it because I think the networks are correct. I just don't think the record supports it. Now, uh, Commissioners uh, Quello and uh, is it Duggan? I I, I I hate to mispronounce yeah. it. Duggan, not Dugan. Duggan. Duggan. If I could, it's General Dugan and Commissioner Duggan, right? if, uh, if you want to be able to separate. Them. Commissioner Duggan, uh, Commissioner Quello, I, I must say I'm disappointed in your votes uh, in a proceeding uh, before the commission last November in which it involved uh, some alleged DEO uh, violations where the rest of your colleagues voted to impose reporting requirements. These were minimal sanctions on uh, broadcasting stations. I'm just talking about reporting requirements far from quotas, uh, far from, uh, quote, uh, goals uh, that are put in concrete uh, 
On the other hand, I'm, I am pleased in general with the Commission's uh, effects test, the one that was adopted in 1987, pleasantly surprised. I didn't expect the positive steps that you've taken in terms of the enforcement of EVO regulations. I'll say that to, to, to all of you, but uh, to, to both uh, Duggan and Quello, well, what seems to be the problem? Are we, uh, aren't we overdoing the uh, concern about uh, not protecting uh, those that have been left behind that want to make it into broadcasting? Can I, I take to the it? first crack? First um, <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> Congressman, I think if there's anything that this uh, seldom, it might seem that we're seldom unanimous, but if we're unanimous on anything, it is in, in the field that you have just raised, uh, equal employment opportunity. Uh, there are a couple of places where Commissioner Quello and I have not, we've never dissented from these decisions. Uh, we have concurred, and I think there have been two concerns where one concurs, that is to say you agree with the majority, but you express a slight concern. Let me tell you what those two concerns are. Imagine a tiny little radio station in a community that is, in fact, guilty of a violation, and we slap a big fine or forfeiture on them. My question is whether, by slapping that big forfeiture, that may be a tremendous amount in terms of their budget, and we take it away in a forfeiture that comes to the federal government. My concern is that we might thus use up the money that they would use to pay the salary of a minority employee the next year. And I have suggested, um, and we're just beginning to test the discussion of it, that perhaps we could require them to put the money in escrow to be yes, used. Sir, as I understand, yes, that uh, decision involved no fine. Well, uh, I, I don't know what decision. I, I'm just talking about the, the, the areas that I remember, and we would have to agree on what the, uh, the other thing has to do with reporting and record keeping. Uh, it occurred to me in, I think, one of these back in the fall, that the record of the station, the performance of the station on equal employment opportunity was excellent. And we docked them for poor record keeping. And it seemed to me um, a little bit questionable that if their behavior was acceptable, that we would uh, go after them so, so much just on record keeping. And it seemed to be making an idol of paperwork. But uh, I wouldn't want you to conclude from either of those that there is any lack of commitment to the ultimate goal. Commissioner Quello, do you want to take a shot at that? Uh, you, you've long had reservations, uh, extreme reservations, I might say, about even uh, trying to catalog how many minorities are in a station. Well, I, I don't think I've had that extreme uh, uh, reservation. Uh, at one time, right before this committee, I was the only one in the whole commission that uh, still uh, voted for minority preferences I have a pretty good record on on minority uh, preferences and and uh, and uh, and EEO the only thing is I've never opposed enforcement of EEO sometimes I disagree with the magnitude of it ten thousand eighteen thousand dollars for a radio station I think the deterrent effect would be handled much less and I'd have to see what the individual case is in in, in, in what you're referring to to, to these to tell you exactly what my reaction was and why. Sometimes I wanted a clarification of our rule. Gentlemen. But, but there's, I'm on record. I don't oppose enforcement of EO. I sometimes... I, Let me conclude. The chairman has gaveled me down. I, I want to assure you, gentlemen, that no legislation will get out of this committee, if I have anything to say with, whether it's radio deregulation or anything, with some <coughs> strong EEO provisions. And I commend you uh, as a group uh, for your efforts since the effects decision, and I hope your wisdom imparts more on Mr. Duggan and Mr. Quello. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair uh, recognizes the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Moorhead, and uh, the chair would note that uh, the gentleman from California has been extremely patient in waiting for his turn and extremely gracious to other members in allowing them to uh, interject themselves into the process. Well, thank you, Mr. Him. Chairman. Uh, on, on Monday, uh, Pete Wilson, the governor of California, who has in the Senate been very interested in this issue, wrote that without the financial syndication uh, uh, rules, that uh, the producers, independent producers would be subjected to strong-arm, take-it-or-leave-it bargaining tactics. Uh, the independent producers who reviewed, reviewed the ruling that uh, you made yesterday say that under this ruling, that's exactly what's going to happen. 
Uh, would you comment on that, please, uh, Chairman Tai? Well, I think to begin with, uh, I uh, uh, you know, I believe that, that that these negotiations are always tough negotiations, and my assumption is that the networks are tough to deal with and that the production community is tough to deal with. And my assumption is that through their agents and through their vice presidents and through their lawyers and through their accountants, uh, they make it uh, very undesirable uh, other than they, those people get paid well. Uh, and so my assumption is that, uh, that uh, the producers that have uh, uh, good quality programs that, uh, that are highly saleable are going to uh, bargain toughly for uh, their full measure of value and that the networks in turn are going to use uh, their uh, network of uh, stations uh, likewise. And I don't find that unseemly. I find that simply the way it happens. Well, well isn't the concern that uh, w without those regulations uh, it'll reduce the diversity in consumer choice because the networks will go other places than to these independent uh, producers if they can't get it for a reasonable price. I do not believe so. In fact, uh, Fox Television, uh, which uh, uh, the majority plan continues to limit, uh, has been the very uh, epitome of diversity, uh, bringing on shows that uh, you and I might not sit down and watch, but which are clearly departures from some of the shows that we have been seeing. I mean, how many different ways are there to produce a cop show, a sitcom? Uh, I don't think that television is uh, overcome with diversity now. In fact, I think the most important dimension of diversity is news diversity. The networks just concluded losing $145 million in their reporting on the Gulf War. Uh, you know, what, what undergirds the economic structure that uh, allows that kind of news diversity? Uh, I just uh, don't see the world uh, uh, in, in the same way that uh, uh, Governor Wilson's uh, uh, opinion, uh, as expressed in that editorial, sees the world. Uh, are there comments that come from the... Uh, I, I would just point out, sir, that news is not syndicated. This debate is about syndication revenue. And we, again, I must point out, are not talking just about large studios and networks. We are talking about the vulnerable people, uh, the small producer of Hallmark Halls of Fame, who has no big studio and who has, is not represented by powerful lawyers, who in fact mortgages her house in order to produce one movie one time for one network. She is terribly vulnerable, but she is where diversity comes from. And when she stands against that network and can have her only opportunity to own a part of those syndication rights extracted as a condition of her getting on the network, something is lost in terms of diversity. And we have to ask, the debate here is about no safeguards or weak safeguards. That is what it's come, it's come to. And I would prefer even stronger safeguards. But I believe that these weak safeguards are better than nothing at all. Any other comment, Mr. Marshall? I think Commissioner Duggan said it all on that one. Do you believe that these changes, some people call deregulation, actually increase competition to the benefit of the consumer? I th or, oh, it should be. Yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I, you know, what we have now is, is the bulk of the independent producers uh, bankrolled by the studios. Uh, and so the studios essentially are the gatekeeper. Uh, that's what Chairman Dingle was talking about, uh, that uh, we protect uh, uh, the producers from the uh, networks, but we don't protect the producers from the studios. Now, I don't suggest that we should protect the producers from the studios. But I would also suggest that creative talent uh, is, is going to increasingly uh, enjoy a premium value and that we're not talking about the monolithic network. We're talking about four networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, that compete vigorously for product. Uh, there is no showing in our record of parallel practices by those networks of some sort of collusion uh, uh, in, you know, that would make them a single buyer. Uh, we're additionally talking increasingly about 
about um, cable networks that are competing for made-for-television movies on a financial parity with the networks. Now, the producers would prefer not to sell to c cable networks. I mean, they don't mind selling to cable networks, but they'd prefer to sell to networks because their product is more valuable in foreign syndication if they've had a network airing here as opposed to an airing on a WTBS or TNT or, you know, cable network. But I just don't think we should be intervening, uh, uh, you know, to, to determine uh, whether producers uh, air on networks or cable networks. Mr. Barrett? I really don't have anything to say about that. Uh, I think my point is very well taken. I disagree with the chairman, but it, it, it is not a disagreeable disagreement, and I made an independent decision and I'm willing to stick by that decision. That's what this agency ought to be about, making independent decisions. Well, I certainly don't intend to bash the networks because I think for the most part they do a, a good job. And, uh, but I am concerned about the independent producer. Many of them are my constituents. Um, and I, I'm just wondering whether this two-step uh, system gives them uh, the protection th that they need, especially the smaller independents, out of which some of the great television shows have come with very little financial help in, in developing their programming. Uh, they've had to take big gambles, and uh, uh, when you take big gambles, you certainly are in a position many times when you are weak at the moment that you uh, that you come to someone that is more powerful financially and need their help to move forward. I wonder whether some of these shows will ever make it uh, on the air without that protection. Mr. I agree Marshall. with you, Congressman Moorhead. The, uh, the protections that we have in here probably are not enough to protect the small independent producers. The 30-day separation still doesn't mean that you know when your, your show is going to be on the air. So your show hasn't been ordered, it hasn't been scheduled, so you don't know that whether you're going to sell anything to the network yet or not. You've got an agreement for a license fee that covers your pilot production cost and the cost of what the programming will be if they order it later on. So when they come to you 30 days later and say, we'd like to have uh, a financial interest in it, as an independent producer, you're going to say, hey, this may make me a little bit more special. This may make my show better. I'm going to have to sell to them now. If you're a studio, you can, you, you've got the financial wherewithal, the deep pockets to stand back and say, no, let's wait. Let's wait until we get uh, farther along down the process, if you choose to take that risk. But again, as Commissioner Duggan stated, the, the choice was between no safeguards or weak safeguards. And I, I'd prefer to su support weak safeguards with the possibility that the independent producers will perhaps survive. Thank you very much, and I see the red lights gone on. Gentleman's time has expired. Now I'll turn and recognize the gentleman from the state of Texas, Mr. Barton. I thank the chairman. It, uh, being a new member of the subcommittee, it's interesting to come to one of these just routine, non-controversial uh, budget hearings. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to come more often. Uh, I have just three questions, uh, and, one, and just as a new member, I don't claim to, to have the knowledge base that some of the other committee members, uh, but just as a general statement of policy, and I think I would ask this to Mr. Quello since he's the commissioner that's been uh, longest on the commission. If we didn't have the FinCEN rules, if we were starting over and the uh, uh, industry, various industry groups came and tried to get the commission to pass the rule that you changed yesterday, what, uh, what, would, what would the commission probably do today if we didn't have anything and it was a, uh, a, new, a new world, so to speak? Uh, the world today is so much different from the world in 1970 when the consent decrees were imposed on the networks that I don't think there'd be any justification for any rule. You would let the parties both negotiate both negotiate in their own best interest and, uh, and both of them getting the best deal they can for their own economic interest, and that's the way it should be. There's, there's no comparison at all with the competitive marketplace we have today with what we had in 1970 when they were imposed, or even in 1983 when I was on the other side of this argument. There's been that much of a change. So uh, 
what what I feel, as I said before, I I think uh, free over the air television itself is is uh, is uh, threatened. You have more and more uh, programs going to cable. Uh, this last year, 1991, uh, cable has the New York New York Yankee games. They they can bid for uh, Olympics. What this means is that uh, I think cable is a very fine, desirable service. But uh, what happens to the 40 or 42 percent that can't afford it? But so I think for universal service, you should have free over-the-air TV. Today, you, you, your opinion is you wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't do anything. Okay. Couldn't be justified. The Justice Department wouldn't support it. Neither would the FTC. All right. On a different subject, something that is a little closer to my district, a rural district down in Texas. Uh, the commission right now has got a, uh, a, a hearing or an undertaking, a study about uh, satellite dish uh, programming and pricing, and uh, the papers that I've read indicate you plan to issue some uh, public results of that in the very near future. Could, could the chairman uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, I hope that the study will be, uh, will be uh, completed, uh, uh, the work done uh, to then complete the report, and that it will be uh, made available in May. In May, okay. And the last question, again on a different subject, uh, uh, the Commission again uh, has looked into deregulating uh, uh, AT&T. And uh, we had a hearing in this subcommittee earlier last year in which many members of Congress indicated uh, uh, an attitude, we wanted you to go slow on that. Uh, this member still wants you to go slow. Uh, uh, what, what's the current commission thinking right now about uh, that particular issue? Well, first of all, it, it uh, is not uh, a, a rulemaking to deregulate AT&T. The rulemaking you have reference to would streamline the regulation in the high end of the market. Uh, uh, additionally, uh, we are looking at a number of other uh, rulemakings regarding uh, uh, what is called 800 number portability, right. uh, the dedicated versus common transport, uh, uh, the credit card uh, validation uh, issues, just to name three, uh, which we believe uh, uh, would, would bring the uh, inter-exchange marketplace uh, in the broad sense, not just in the higher end sense, in the broad sense. Uh, closer to competition uh, or, or, or level playing field competition. Uh, so I think we're looking at, at these issues comprehensively, but you know, I would defer to my, to my colleagues uh, who I suspect have, you know, or at least some of them might have thoughts on it. I, I think that uh, we, we certainly uh, did two things on item six and seven yesterday that are leading us, uh, m uh, making it more competitive than exchange area. One of my concerns has always been and I think in your state, if you look at Texatel uh, and the small competitive uh, long distance carriers, I am convinced that anything that we take into consideration, have to take into to consideration uh, groups like Scotty Flowers and groups like that out of Texas and, uh, and, and Florida. And I think that if you, could, if you look at the whole inter exchange market, we would be remiss if we simply look at those three carriers and don't look at the small uh, carriers. I thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would re reserve the right to uh, submit several other questions for the record for the uh, commissioners to answer in writing. And just as an editorial comment, uh, just what little preparation I've done for this hearing, you folks got a lot, of, a lot of jurisdiction. It's amazing when you go through and read all the issues that you're involved with. Uh, I give you a lot of credit for trying to come up with something uh, uh, sensible because it's a, you've got a difficult uh, difficult job and as Commissioner Barrett said you do have to be in the independent voices uh, that's what you put on there and uh, I can I can say I think you're, you're you're doing it in the in the best sense of public service and I want to commend you for that time has expired we will submit whatever questions he uh, may have in writing to you, and we would uh, request that uh, the responses come in an expeditious fashion, not only to his questions, but to the other members as well. Uh, now I'll turn and recognize the uh, gentleman from Oregon? Or Maryland? From Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I missed the earlier part of the uh, hearing when you were uh, going into great detail on FinCEN. Um, 
when you watch the news last night and read the press reports, uh, it's difficult to say, you know, who wins or, or, or loses in this, uh, in this matter. It seems that uh, the commentary was that a lot, both sides have been hurt. One of the things, obviously, when you watch the news, you, you see this debate always pitted a lot of times as the networks versus Hollywood. Um, but what I would like to particularly uh, inquire about, maybe you can explain to me, is, is uh, the small, I know some of the questions have, um, have dealt with this, on the smaller independent producers. What specifically do they gain uh, out, out, of this, uh, out of this matter? Could you elaborate a little bit for me on that? I mean, we, I understand, well, you know, I, what I the networks... That, you know, I, I think there was, there was clearly uh, uh, an interest uh, on the part of all of us uh, in, in the small independent producers. I think it's a somewhat difficult uh, category to define, frankly. You've got, uh, uh, you know, independent producers that, uh, that are quite uh, large and have quite deep pockets. And then you have, as Commissioner Duggan pointed out, uh, uh, individuals who are seeking to get into the market. Uh, I believe uh, the uh, the majority plan uh, will probably make uh, make it possible for the networks uh, to uh, be more of a source of, uh, of venture capital, uh, and I think that in that sense, uh, uh, not as far as I would have gone, uh, there has been some expansion of the sources of banking, if you will, for small producers. Two areas uh, in particular in this uh, provision where independent producers will now have the opportunity to have new sources of financing. They probably, based on their comments, won't like the, w the way they can obtain that, but the new sources are the networks can, uh, can enter into domestic co-productions with uh, them as in-house productions. The, the good news is, is it uh, uh, helps the independent producer get upfront financing as opposed to financing later on. The networks can be there. The bad news is, is that the independent producer uh, may feel like uh, that he's been, he or she's perhaps been um, uh, coerced into, into engaged, selling off more of their rights, coming in-house more so than they would like to have done so. We do have a restriction there, however, again, that says that um, the network cannot, um, cannot condition putting show on by virtue of making them come in in-house. The second area in which they can obtain new financing is in the, in the area of straight outside productions. The independent producers will now have the opportunity to sell their uh, financial interests, domestic syndication rights, and foreign syndication rights to the networks uh, 30 days after the initial licensing period has been agreed to. Again, the, the independent producers are not happy with that because they don't think it's a sufficient safeguard from, safe, from, from extraction. But uh, they do have new sources of financing available to them. Any other comments on that? I mean, so clearly you feel that the, the new sources of capital outweighs any of the possible abuses that may occur. There's a curious uh, difference of opinion here. And, and Congressman, just to illustrate, I'd, I'd like to resort to um, the old story of the Boy Scout who helped little old ladies across the street only to find out that many of the little old ladies didn't want that help. They weren't going across the street. Um, and the independent producers are in the position of getting an offer of help from the networks, but being deeply suspicious that the help comes at the expense of rights that are important to them in terms of back-end ownership and syndication rights. Mm -hmm. And the, the debate is about whether we can provide that help without disadvantaging those people uh, who get that so-called help. And it is an extraordinarily difficult question. Uh, do, are these little old ladies being helped across the street, or are they being dragged and coerced? That is the essence of the question. What are some of the, I mean, obviously, uh, your concerns about the foreign syndication rights. Uh, what are your concern with regards to the, the little old ladies and some of the uh, abuses that may occur in that regard? Uh, let me attempt a brief answer, and then uh, perhaps uh, Commissioner Marshall can also address the question. There is a sense in which foreign syndication rights are not really back-end rights. They are front-end rights. 
If you look at it from the standpoint of the independent producer, the non-network producer or the small independent, they customarily sell off the foreign syndication rights and are actually showing the programs that are being produced uh, abroad under those rights uh, and they are deriving d immediate cash flow from the sale of those rights. And according to their testimony in the record, they desperately need that immediate cash flow in order to finance what they call the deficit, the unmet cost of production. The network license fee does not cover that. So they desperately need control of those rights or some power over those rights or not to have those rights extracted so they can get that essential cash flow to pay the deficit. If the networks are able to extract or coerce if there's even a slim danger that that coercion can occur, then they are producing at a deficit, and they also are not getting the source of vital front-end, not back-end money that they need from mm -hmm. foreign syndication rights. That is the issue. Any other comments on that? There's <laughs> um, a 30-day, uh, maybe you can talk about uh, what are the other safeguards for them besides the 30-day kind of cooling off period? The safeguards uh, inherent in the plan on the outside production side are um, first the separation of the two negotiations by 30 days, second the requirements that the networks must certify that any acquisition of rights that they obtain are um, not obtained as a condition of airing, ordering, or renewal. It's an important certification because it then it, it has to be maintained in the network's O and O files and it then leaves them subject to a statement of misrepresentation should a producer ever decide to challenge it. My concern with the uh, two-step, as I've stated in, in prior testimony and in my statement on it, is that, of course, we're relying on the very producer who agreed to the, agreed to the sale of these rights to then be the one that, that challenges the certification in the first place. Mm -hmm. The other safeguards on the in-house side, the, the in-house, the producers have the safeguard first with respect to domestic co-productions, it's a producer initiated, and it has to be offered in writing by the producer up front. So you would then at least know that they wanted to in, in, enter into this uh, uh, co-production in the first place. And again, you have the requirement that the network must certify that the in-house production was not made a, pr a condition of um, employment, if you will. Those are the safeguards. Any other comments? If not, thanks, Mr. Chair. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Oregon uh, for a round of questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Chairman Sykes, uh, only one question on uh, the financial interest uh, issue. Is there anything left of the original rule other than the 30-day cooling off period? Well. You know, it, it uh, probably is best uh, left to others to explain what uh, is remaining, but there are certainly uh, rules that relate to uh, the syndication marketplace uh, uh, that, for example, uh, do not allow the uh, networks to engage in active syndication. Uh, there are anti-favoritism rules uh, that would preclude the networks uh, from dealing uh, in a favoritism sort of manner with their owned and operated stations or their affiliates. Uh, they have to file reports uh, to certify uh, that they uh, are, are, are to let us have data that we can look at to make sure they have not engaged in that kind of favoritism. So, you know, one of the things that has not been discussed today, uh, Congressman, is the uh, layer of rules that exists uh, in an effort to uh, keep the networks from favoring uh, their uh, stations over uh, independent television stations. I, uh, uh, Congressman, could I add to that? Uh, I would just like to register my view that there's very little uh, left of the rules except some weak safeguards, and um, uh, this is a very substantial uh, departure and a very substantial deregulation in favor of the networks. Well, I, uh, I intend to, to study it like, uh, like our colleagues, but, you know, on first uh, reading, the networks can obtain a financial interest in all programming and all uh, day parts, obtain all foreign syndication uh, rights, uh, obtain syndication rights for all domestic uh, uh, syndication sales as long as they turn it uh, over to, uh, to management. 
So in the days ahead, I hope that uh, you all and others will enlighten us in the Congress uh, on this specific question of what is actually left in a major way other than the 30-day cooling off rule. I'm a member who has been fairly open to all sides uh, on this issue. At one point I explained at a town hall meeting in my district that this was a battle of overdogs. There were no underdogs in, uh, in this case. The, there were networks and there were independent uh, uh, producers and uh, uh, like a lot of members, we're trying to uh, uh, make our way through some of the details of your uh, decision, but uh, I can't find much left other than that 30-day cooling off rule. Chairman Congressman, Mark, you did say Congressman, that you might you might note uh, that that uh, because the uh, the uh, in-house production limit expired uh, in the consent decree last year, that the networks, uh, as of November of last year, could uh, present could produce, excuse me, 100 percent of their programming in-house. Uh, the limit uh, in the majority plan is now at 40 percent. So that's a rather significant uh, new limitation. Let me uh, avail myself of uh, the generosity of, uh, of the chairman to, uh, to touch on a couple of uh, other issues, if I could, uh, uh, with you, uh, Chairman Sykes. I, I've been very interested in this issue of, uh, of 900 numbers and have followed uh, what the commission uh, has done uh, in this area. but. I'm concerned that it doesn't adequately deal uh, with some of the problems that consumers face with the long distance companies uh, in particular. And uh, it seems to me what the long distance companies are essentially doing with respect to 900 services is they provide the overhead for the con men. I mean, that's essentially one of the problems uh, here. And uh, consumers in particular are having difficulty getting refunds, uh, refunds where there have been found to, to be, uh, be violations. And uh, recently at one of our hearings, we had uh, uh, state attorneys generals and, and others representing problems they were having getting uh, difficulty uh, on refunds. I am curious whether you think that uh, you are going to have to take additional steps with respect uh, to 900 uh, numbers uh, in terms of dealing uh, with this problem. Uh, certainly long distance carriers should uh, get, uh, uh, get their tariffs, but these other you know, charges, which they cite as basically you know, their, their overhead, um, basically contribute to the problems that consumers are facing. And I'm, I'm curious whether you think that the commission should, uh, with respect to 900 numbers, uh, focus on getting actual refunds uh, for consumers where there have been uh, violations uh, and penalties assessed against the long distance companies? Well, the, the long distance companies uh, are common carriers. Correct. And they must hold themselves out uh, to all comers. Uh, and they do so under a tariffed regime. Uh, and under the First Amendment, we can't. Uh, uh, and, and other than in indecent programming, which is one of the carve-out areas, uh, intervene. Uh, we did, of course, intervene, uh, as did the Congress, in the dial a porn situation, and that was uh, sustained uh, quite recently. Uh, now, uh, we have uh, worked very closely with the Federal Trade Commission, which uh, tends to handle the cases and controversies, uh, to try to, uh, first of all, put uh, people out of business that uh, are con men, and secondly, uh, try to get some relief for the people who have been victimized. But we are also proceeding separately with a proposed rulemaking, which would involve preambles, statements of uh, costs, uh, hang-up opportunities, which would separate uh, the, uh, the uh, billing for a 900 service provider from the billing from a local exchange carrier so that the person couldn't lose their uh, local exchange connection. Uh, uh, if they didn't pay their 900 bill, assuming there's some controversy about that. So I think we're proceeding on a rather broad front to try to handle this. We're, we're, we're not connecting on this point. I think that certainly the tariffs should be uh, uh, costs that uh, the long distance companies get. What I'm concerned about in the big bulk of these uh, uh, costs are in these service charges and they're not being refunded uh, to the customer. In fact, we had a witness at our last hearing uh, where uh, uh, C&P, the local carrier, was willing to uh, uh, write it off, but the long distance uh, company was turning it uh, over to bill collectors. And uh, I think that it's important that uh, consumers get refunds 
and that the commission go after this question of service charges and there's no disagreement on, on tariffs. Do you think that the commission should uh, tackle this question of, uh, of service charges, which amounts, in my view, to providing the overhead for the con men? Well, that's precisely what we would do in separating uh, the, uh, the uh, provision of the uh, service uh, from the local exchange bill. But what about with respect to refunds? I mean, what's happening when there's been a uh, uh, settlement and a refund ordered to consumers, the long distance people have taken a huge chunk off the top. I think there was one case, uh, $165,000 right off the top went to uh, the long distance company because they said they had their service charges. When you're speaking long distance companies uh, uh, in some sort of a joint venture with these no. uh, 900 services, no. you're, you're simply talking about the charges uh, in the tariff rates? That's correct. The service costs. Yeah. The problem we have there, Mr. Chairman, is the fact that we do, we, we do not have nothing to do with the provider's information as opposed to the cost of the call itself. I think the refund, you're talking about a refund that is cost, that is, is, is assessed to the provider, by the provider, as opposed to the provider of the connection. But what I'm, I'm concerned about is that the attorneys general are saying that they have these major settlements you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what happens is the long distance companies take this huge cut right off the top. There's one case, $165,000, to uh, cover their service charges. And that doesn't seem to me uh, to be right. And it does seem that they're just providing overhead to uh, all these ripoff artists. And I think that the commission, if the commission doesn't go after these people, I have real question about who can, because I think that this is a uh, federal uh, issue. And let me see if I can ask the commissioner. Uh, uh, I don't have my, my name. Duggan. Text. Yeah, Ms. Duggan. Yes. Do you, do you share my view that the commission should uh, address this issue? Uh, I am not uh, fully conversant with this issue, uh, Mr. Congressman. But I can assure you that if you're concerned, we're going to be concerned, and we're going to look into it. The gentleman's time has expired. And I wanted to say this to the gentleman from Oregon. Um, if you're concerned, I'm concerned. And, uh, and uh, to the extent that the commission is concerned, and you're concerned, and I'm concerned, I then I'm pretty sure that the concerns of the people out there who are concerned are going to be dealt with. And I can assure the gentleman from Oregon that we are going to pass a piece of legislation this year out of this subcommittee, which is going to deal with the issue of 900 numbers and their abuses. And we want to work very closely with the gentleman from Oregon to uh, guarantee that his concerns are dealt with. I, I should quit while I'm ahead, particularly given this plethora of concern that has, uh, has been uh, uh, Addressed, but but Chairman Sykes, on, on just one one point, uh, the gentleman's time has period. expired. With uh, unanimous consent, the gentleman grant, I, be granted one yeah. additional minute I, to pursue I, I a and, colloquy with the and, chairman. And I'm not even I'm not going to take that, Chairman Sykes. The point is, I think what the commission has done in many respects is very good, and these preambles and everything up front makes a great deal of sense because that's prophylactic and preventive. My concern is when somebody slips through and the. Uh, uh, inspectors for the postmaster said that there were a number of these frauds that were clearly known about. We've got to have something at the end of the line to make sure that people actually get these refunds. And I'm going to uh, take advantage of all this concern to work with the commission. And I, uh, I thank uh, Chairman Markey. The gentleman's time uh, has expired. I might note that uh, the chairman of the full committee has written me a letter requesting that there be uh, a transcript uh, of uh, these proceedings today uh, made uh, available as quickly as possible. And uh, I can uh, assure one and all that that will be the case. Uh, and uh, it will be made available to the full committee chairman and to all other parties that uh, are interested. Uh, let me now turn and re recognize the uh, gentleman from the state of uh, Colorado, uh, Mr. Schaefer. I thank the uh, chair. <laughs> Before I ask a couple of questions, I would uh, like to uh, praise uh, Chairman Sykes for his initiative in revising the FCC regulation 
of the U.S. telephone company uh, agreements with their foreign counterparts uh, pertaining to the Desert Storm. I understand this action is going to be taken in the next month. It's going to be easier to negotiate uh, lower and more, more cost-based international accounting rates uh, for our, our people over there, and I did want to make mention of that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn to the spectrum issue uh, just briefly and get uh, some of the uh, committee's uh, thoughts on that. Uh, as the uh, President's budget proposal is a recommendation of the, uh, of the auctions on the uh, spectrum. And I'd like to have any one of the, the uh, five uh, uh, people here today talk about uh, this for just a second. And uh, I guess I'll start it with a basic question. Do uh, you believe that uh, spectrum reallo uh, reallocation is really necessary given the anticipated uh, non-government needs? Given the what, excuse me? The, the uh, non-government spectrum needs, non-governmental. We, 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 uh, we have major demands for additional spectrum by emerging technologies, uh, personal communications network technologies, uh, digital audio broadcasting technologies, local area network, laptop computer technologies, and I could go on and on. So. I believe it is important that we have uh, additional spectrum available for those emerging technologies. And you know, we're doing a study at the FCC. Uh, I think uh, most of us have supported. I know I have the Dingle Bill uh, and, and, and the one that Congressman Markey joined in. Uh, and uh, so, yes. Well, I, I guess uh, what we're looking at maybe, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the approach. Uh, do we go the auction route? Uh, or some other approach. Uh, I'd like to get some comments on this. Well, do you want to begin with me, or would you prefer to By anyone? Else? Anyone. You, Mr. Chairman, you go right ahead. Well, first. let me let me speak for myself because the commission uh, has not considered uh, the auction. I understand approach. that. Uh, I I support auctions. Uh, I I believe there have to be services that are not subject to auction. Uh, they're too numerous to mention. Uh, you know, we've talked about some of them in respect to uh, to fees, like amateur services, for example, uh, public safety services. Uh, I don't believe that additional uh, an additional simulcast channel and high definition television should be subject to an auction. Uh, and as I understand, the administration's bill would provide the FCC with discretion in that respect. Uh, where I have, uh, and the reason I have spoken so strongly about to auctions is, number one, I think it will speed uh, the licensure process, and number two, rather than making uh, uh, millionaires or billionaires of people uh, who come in and, and, and uh, you know, win by lottery uh, and then uh, often immediately resell uh, the like spectrum. the cellular phone situation. That, that's the best example I can think of. Uh, it, will, it will provide uh, deserved revenue to the taxpayers since we are dealing with a public asset. Someone else care to comment, please? Well, historically, historically before, I, I haven't, I, I've opposed auctions, but I'm open-minded on it. At, at whatever comes down, I'd like to consider it. Mr. Barnett? I really would, I think OET, the study Sherman talked about, is uh, something I'd like to see uh, completed before I make that kind of comment. Obviously, whether it be auctions or what one ought to keep in mind that it is a public interest that we ought to be more concerned about as opposed to the process by which we get rid, rid of the spectrum. Well, uh, let's just uh, then, without comment on the auctions, uh, do you believe that the reallocation is necessary? I, as I said, OET has initiated a study, and uh, I'm sure that study will point out what I ought to believe. Anyone else? <coughs> Ms. Marshall? Well, I'd say that there's, there's a critical shortage spectrum for new technologies as well as established ones, and uh, that's why I have supported the, the, the Dingle Markey Bill on spectrum reallocation. And I definitely think we need to be uh, reviewing our, our spectrum, even what the study that the, the Commission has going on right now to see um, all these newcomers, whether we're going to have enough spectrum available for them and, and uh, see how to do it. And I also concur that auctions are definitely something that should be considered with, uh, as, as, a, as a way to um, parcel out this. Uh, as one of the approaches. As one of the approaches, yes. Mr. Duggan, any comment, sir? Well, I, I remember um, General Haig turned caveat into a verb when he testified before a congressional committee. Uh, I would like to simply uh, mention a possible caveat having to do with auctions, and that is that 
the historic connection of the public interest standard, particularly in broadcasting, um, you know, as you move up toward those services that have an impact on the culture. Uh, I would like to see us, if we move to auctions, find some way of ensuring that responsibility in the public interest is not simply ignored. Perhaps making uh, some public interest um, definitions go along with the spectrum that we auction off. Otherwise, it seems to me we face at least the theoretical danger that a, a license will become simply a piece of uh, commercial property to be traded uh, in a sense that was never intended by those persons who were the founders of the idea of licenses as stewardships and trusteeships. So I'd like to see us defend the idea of the public interest or what is left of that idea as we move into the brave new world of auctions. Well, one uh, final question, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the status of uh, the FCC's responsibilities for uh, HDTV standard testing and selection, uh, where are we at? The anticipation is that the, uh, or, or let me put it this way, the, the plan is that the uh, testing will begin uh, at the Advanced Television Test Center uh, in, uh, in uh, June or July. Uh, we are working closely with uh, that center. Uh, the testing uh, is at this point intended to be wrapped up uh, in the fall of 1992 at which point uh, the advisory committee uh, uh, will be making recommendations to the commission uh, and we will then have the notice of proposed rulemaking regarding what standard uh, should be chosen. Any comments by any other commissioners? I uh, yield back any time. Okay. The gentleman's uh, time has expired and uh, while the uh, the crowd is uh, thinning here in the uh, seventh inning, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, issues of uh, Hollywood and uh, the broadcasters um, have uh, been dealt with, and I may re return to them again um, in, a, in, a, in a moment, are issues that are related to the broadcasting and Hollywood community. What I'd like to do is to move over for a second uh, over to uh, uh, some other issues which uh, have in many ways uh, uh, just as much importance to the American people. And the decisions which uh, have been made or will have to be made by the uh, Commission. And uh, reflecting upon Mr. Oxley's comment uh, about the relevance of these issues to the residents of Finley, Ohio, uh, I think that they would be interested in the Commission's views on the effect which the Commission decision yesterday affirming the local exchange company price cap order on reconsideration will have upon their telephone bills. Uh, the Commission has often stated that the implementation of the uh, price cap will have the effect of making the consumer better off than they were under the traditional rate of return system uh, that had been in place for a generation. However, last week, uh, the local exchange companies, um, the seven regional bell operating companies, GTE, United Telephone, Contel, Rochester, uh, SNET, uh, and others, filed for a total of a mere $177 million in interstate access charge reductions to take effect on July 1st, 1991. In contrast, as you know, since divestiture under rate of return regulation, the customers of LEC interstate access charges have received an average of over $1 billion per year in annual access charge filings. Uh, these interstate access charge reductions directly resulted in a 40% reduction in the price of long distance telephone calls. So after years of the FCC's success in extracting much larger reductions under rate of return regulation, how do you explain such a low reduction in the first price cap annual access filing? And to just give you a some idea of the magnitude of this issue, 
uh, as we're talking about a $1 billion per year syn uh, foreign syndication marketplace uh, to be divvied up amongst the various American corporate uh, players in terms of their ability to compete, here we're talking about a billion dollars a year that was going back into the pockets of the consumers in our country. Back in Finley, Ohio, Malden, Massachusetts. Now this has been reduced down to $177 million. The, the rest of the money to stay in the hands of these corporations. Uh, could you tell me, Mr. Chairman, uh, what happened? I thought that uh, price caps were supposed to uh, make the system so efficient uh, to build in the incentives to reduce costs that they would be able now to return perhaps uh, even more to the consumer in terms of benefits. Price caps is working quite well, Mr. Chairman. The fact of the matter is yesterday in the uh, reconsideration order uh, we made adjustments to accounts which will result in another $356 million uh, that will be saved. Uh, secondly, uh, when you make mm -hmm. these adjustments... Is it, will that be in the first year? Uh, yes. So the real yes. total then for the no, first year No, 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 wait, wait, let, let me finish my answer, please. Well, why don't you, I just want to have an well, idea of the numbers that you're talking about. First, are you talking about 177 two, plus no. 300 and what was the number? Uh, 177 plus 356 million. Okay, so it's it, it will be over 500 million then 500 under the first million. year price cap reduction. But but you see the you know the adjustments that you're talking about earlier were from highballing. In other words, uh, you 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 get to under rate of return a claim that you need so much, you know, and they uh, and they assume that the regulators, whether it's state regulators or federal regulators, are going to cut it back. And so they come in and make uh, demands, and then the regulators get to be heroes by cutting it back. And so I would simply suggest to you that, that, that it's comparing apples and oranges to compare rate of return regulation to price cap regulation. So there was not a real reduction in long distance rates of 40 percent over those years. Is that what you're saying? There were reductions in long distance rates over those years. I'm just saying and that the they, numbers are less than meets were, the were eye. Were they related to the access uh, uh, reductions? Certainly, that and subscriber line charges had a significant effect on the, uh, on the long distance uh, reductions. Well, you know, you have, uh, you have a, a problem here in, in that uh, in, a, in a declining cost industry and one that was reflected in real cuts over the last uh, seven years heading into the price cap regime, uh, we saw uh, real reductions. Now, you can say they were highballing it, all right, initially, but the net result actually was dramatic reductions in long distance charges. And, uh, I think that the consumers out there are going to have to have a few highballs if they're going to be able to see the reductions that you're talking about well, under price cap. It seems to me to be illusory in many ways if you compare it with the old regime. Well, those reductions are like uh, saying after a used car is priced that you've made a big reduction when you uh, get the uh, price down. Uh, and I'm simply saying that, 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 that we're talking about $500 million in real reductions, number one. And number two, these numbers are partially affected by lighter demand for interstate access. Well, uh, let me ask you this then, Mr. Chairman. Are you telling me that the rates for our consumers now, at the end of the day, uh, are going to go down at the same rate that they were going down under rate of return? Will it have the same percentage reduction? I, I think we're going to see rates go down as, as rapidly as they were under rate of return. And I think that as the uh, sharing mechanism kicks in, uh, in the uh, price caps that you'll see even communities uh, can afford any uh, relief to those uh, consumers. In the uh, FCC uh, proceeding, and by the way, again, something which uh, the Wall Street Journal even uh, has commented exceeds a billion. In fact, exceeds six billion dollars, in their opinion, uh, in excessive charges that are imposed upon consumers each year, uh, dwarfing this whole uh, uh, foreign syndication uh, market uh, issue. Now, let's focus on this. This does directly affect c consumers uh, in our country. In the FCC proceeding to uh, change the existing three signal standard for effective competition, one option is to allow franchise authorities to regulate cable rates when there are fewer than six unduplicated over-the-air signals and the cable system penetration rate is greater than 50 percent.
My first question to you is, wouldn't a percentage cap possibly reward poor operators while arguably subjecting good operators to rate regulation? Can you explain, Mr. Chairman, the rationale behind this proposal? I think, I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I think that the rationale was, uh, when it was put out in the rulemaking, uh, that there are areas where there are a lot of uh, what might be called uh, substitutable uh, leisure time activities. Uh, Los Angeles has often been cited as an example where you've got a video cassette store uh, quite handy to most neighborhoods where you've got a lot of over-the-air television where you've got baseball, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore the, uh, the percentage uh, of subscribers is well under 50 percent for that reason, and therefore if it's well under 50 percent there is a real incentive for the cable operator to price quite competitively to bring more people onto the system because of the advertising revenue part of the cable business, the pay-per-view aspect of the cable business, et cetera. I think that other commissioners and I are sharing, however, the concern that you express uh, through your question. All right, well, let me, let me add one little bit of additional information into the mix, and then I'd like to get your view again, Mr. Chairman, and the other commissioners, uh, because there's, uh, there's no issue that, uh, in fact, uh, elicits more response from, uh, from people on the streets to congressmen back home than this question of uh, cable rates and cable service. Uh, this is how the telecommunication revolution, along with telephone rates, affects their lives in their homes uh, every day. And we have to have uh, uh, answers that uh, are intelligible to uh, consumers. One commissioner, uh, uh, on the FCC was quoted at the National Cable Television Association convention two weeks ago as stating that it might be necessary to adjust the penetration standard in order to avoid, and I quote, ensnaring such a large percentage of cable operators. Another commissioner was quoted as responding to an estimate that the proposed six signal test would, subject, would uh, subject about 80% of cable systems to re-regulation with the following. I quote again, I don't think most cable operators want that, and I don't think too many people up here want that. Is the Commission's goal, Mr. Chairman, uh, in redefining effective competition to minimize the extent of regulation? Uh, in determining a penetration figure? Are you searching for a politically acceptable number? Or are you making a good faith effort to ensure that consumers are protected from abusive behavior by some cable operators and the bad actors who are in the industry? In other words, pragmatically dealing with this problem of the 10, 15 percent, 20 percent maybe of these cable operators who are just running wild out there in their increases uh, year after year with no effective means of checking their abuses. Mr. Chairman, any of the other members that wish to comment? Well, let, let, let me comment within, within what I think are the, first of all, no, we're not trying to make political deals. We're going to act within the record. That's number one. Number two, uh, the confines of the Cable Act of 1984 go to what is called the basic tier, and the basic tier as defined in the Cable Act of 1984 is those retransmitted signals. And so I think whatever action we take at the Commission is going to be constrained by the Cable Act of 1984. Any other commissioners who wish to comment? Mr. Duggan. Mr. Chairman, since, since I was uh, one of those persons you quoted, and I did say that I had fears about the penetration standard, allow me to explain. Uh, my fear is that any, there's an element of arbitrariness or, or a sort of mechanical quality about almost any standard that we come up with that is not real competition itself. And if we use a penetration standard, uh, there is always the danger of ensnaring people who are behaving perf perfectly well, getting them into a situation of being regulated uh, so that if they should come up with a perfectly reasonable uh, and modest increase, it could be refused um, and, and they could uh, be disadvantaged. And I do have that concern. I, I have a certain pessimism, not to say despair, about this whole field because I, th I feel that what we're trying to cope with is failures of government years ago. 
when the initial system for franchising cable systems was established, I think there was a failure to put people's feet to the fire about genuine competition. I think, unfortunately, in the 1984 Act, uh, there may have been some reluctance, uh, for whatever reasons, good or bad, to hold systems feet to the fire um, and communities feet to the fire about real competition. Now we're trying to cope with those failures of government and I have a sense of real pessimism and despair about uh, whether we can do it very well. Well, I don't necessarily agree with you and uh, last year we made an effort, as you know, to uh, increase uh, satellite competition and unfortunately the administration uh, uh, said that it would veto the bill if it contained a provision which added additional access to programming. Uh, that uh, would ease the, the, the financial burden on this uh, competitive new way in which uh, programming could get into people's homes. That is, the satellite dishes that wouldn't cost uh, 5000 bucks, but maybe only three or 400 uh, And uh, the administration, unfortunately, uh, not you necessarily, I'm talking about uh, OMB and others that are more ideologically driven, I think, than they ought to be in an area which is one that should be characterized by uh, a lack of ideology and, pragmatism and its substitution. Um, we're also looking now at cable telco. Should we let the telephone companies in? Uh, you're, you're pointing out basically that the cable industry is not a regulated utility. And so it operates under a different standard and a different set of guidelines. And the telephone companies offer a potential for competition. And, uh, and it's something that we're looking at and looking at very seriously. Uh, of course, it has to be coupled with a set of safeguards, a set of protections, accounting, uh, cross-subsidization, uh, predatory uh, uh, practices which uh, uh, could disadvantage uh, the consumer ultimately because of the lack of a, of, a robust competitive marketplace. Uh, and that's very important to us. And, uh, and as we move uh, in more and more in that direction, and uh, we realize the, the difficulties that uh, have existed in controlling cable rights competition is something that um, uh, we find very attractive on this uh, committee. Um, and we know that there's some disagreement even on this panel with regards to the role which uh, cable, uh, the telephone companies uh, could play in this field. Uh, my hope that it would be limited to the question of uh, the extent to which you could put in the safeguards. You could build in the protections. You wouldn't have to give the, um, the additional grants of authority beyond what was necessary in order to ensure that you do have other ways of getting into people's homes and serving as a, a control over prices. Uh, rather than some ideological bar to it because it's just uh, difficult for me to understand how that would uh, arise. Um, let me let me, I'd like to come back to that uh, cable telco issue and, and, and elicit some uh, responses from you, perhaps, if we can uh, wrap up the hearing by 1 o'clock. But before I do that, let me, let me uh, move over to the question of, uh, 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 that ro arose at a recent uh, hearing on H.R. 1303, the, uh, the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act. Uh, Chairman Sykes uh, urged Congress to relax uh, statutory uh, prohibition on uh, telephone company provision of uh, video programming. Uh, Chairman Sykes also was quoted in Broadcasting Magazine as expressing support for a video dial tone approach at the NCTA convention two weeks ago. At the same forum, however, according to the trade press, Commissioners uh, Quello, Marshall, Duggan were quoted as expressing considerable skepticism about the possibility of telco entry into the video programming marketplace. Specifically, according to Broadcasting Magazine, the three commissioners expressed concern about the danger of allowing one company potentially to control the flow of all electronic communication into the home and expressed skepticism as to whether proper safeguards could be constructed to prevent cross-subsidization and other abusive behavior by the uh, telcos. Uh, could we quickly go down so that we can get on the record how each of you feel about uh, this subject, what your, re what your position is, what your reservations are about uh, moving into this field, and uh, how we should view this issue as we're moving uh, towards it. Mr. Barrett. I think, Mr. Chairman, when you talk about fiber deployment and new technologies and the broadband methods, you necessarily, it seems to me, if you don't mind me taking a few moments, you necessarily, it seems to me, engender the whole question of telco entry. And I am convinced that 
uh, local exchange companies view their, their entry into the, into the cable business as a logical extension of their service. We have two problems. One is that it's a problem uh, that, that you raise uh, rather sufficiently in terms of the cross-subsidy. We have another problem is that when you reach a point in a country where you have 94, 95 percent of penetration, there is no revenue growth in that market. Therefore, one has to look for new revenue growth. And what you find here is a technology that now can deliver new sources of revenue growth, which happens to be cable. And there is no question in my mind that the telephone companies are capable of, del of delivering every kind of system that you want in your home. The question is, do many of us become unwittingly so uh, suppliers of the funds to do that? It is not a question of technology. My concern is whether or not we unwittingly become uh, contributors to that kind of a process. But I think it is driven by the lack of growth in the, in, in, in the, in the market, in the, in the domestic market in the United States, and the need to incre increase rate of returns, if I may, or, or, or re revenue streams, to find new streams of revenue. And that's the only place to do it is in new services, be that new services cable, be it uh, God, I guess NAB said, God help them, uh, uh, radio or whatever, you know, but, so, uh, but I, they have the potential to so do it all. So let me just ask this, would you, would you consider uh, 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 positively then the, the construction of at least a separate subsidiary to uh, deal with those issues? Would that I, be I something would, that you would, would be talking I, about? I would like to see what the implications are on, on, on the free over the over there broadcast. I, I, I understand that. Apart from the effects it has upon other industries in terms of the structural safeguards that you would establish, would a separate subsidiary be something that you could be favorably disposed towards? I'm not a great fan of structural safeguards, okay. in, in the sense of structural separations, that is. Well, you know, and let me tell you why, Mr. Well, Chairman. I understand that, but you understand as well that basically then you, you, you uh, foreclose the opportunity for us to put in place the prophylactic protections which could then defend I against do, the I abuses that could affect it, it the, goes, uh, the cable yeah. industry or the uh, free over-the-air broadcasters or the publishers. It so, goes to the, hard qu the whole question, I think, of whether or not we are ready to have one delivery system, I think. I, I understand, but before we get to that question, I would have to understand the extent to which you could overcome your ideological opposition to any separate subsidiaries, uh, because that's a pragmatic way in which we could at least try to pursue the concept of uh, setting up a, a separate way in which and we can could... And can I tell you, why, you why, why, why I tend to oppose separate subs purely from an economic perspective, not one of a perspective of uh, what impact it may have on an individual? One of the things that you have information service companies able to do is to put together and aggregate packages to deliver to people as a package. Once you go into separate subs, you, you clearly eliminate the possibility of, uh, of offering the kind of packages that, that you can, that, that you'd like to. I, I think we can overcome the problems that you have there, uh, Commissioner. I think that the, the real issue would be the extent to which um, a telephone company, knowing that they had to deal with these issues out of a separate subsidiary, would then decide economically that they wanted to get into the area. So that uh, you would still be left with your protection of, let's say, the cable industry or the, tele or the, uh, or the broadcasters from being affected by unfair competition, but you would have at least have constructed something that maybe added to the economic difficulty of the, of the telephone companies in competing, but gave them the option of deciding then whether or not they would want to they proceed would take with, the that, with, that, uh, with that impediment. Yeah. Mr. Quello. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I support Chairman Sykes and dial tone. I think uh, it may be an evolutionary process. They may have to first go in as common carriers. However, I would think one line into the home providing everything would be the ultimate in efficiency of scale and, and economy of scale but it also would be the ultimate in, uh, in a, a, a monopoly power. AT&T was broken up for a lot less monopoly power than having one wire providing phone, data processing, uh, interactive, video tone, all that, and that's the problem. My problem is this, and I've told him, I said, if you can arrange for universal free television service with the TV service, uh, you make the broadcast the deal that they can't refuse, I think you'd be on your way home with me. I understand. The problem that we have, as you know, uh Mr. Quello, is that right now cable is a monopoly and it goes into 99% of the communities in America that have a, a cable system have no other system. And so uh, billions and billions of dollars 
uh, are going out of the pockets of consumers unjustifiably each year to pay for services that should have some controls. So either we put real controls on the rates, which the cable industry opposes, um, and I think many on this commission oppose as well, um, or we introduce new competition. But it's got to be one or the other. You can't have an unregulated utility. That is an, that is an absolutely unacceptable economic uh, structure within the framework of American economic history. So you can pick one or the other. Pick your form. You want to be a utility? You're regulated. You want to be out there in the free market? You're unregulated. But you can't. This hybrid form that they seek to uh, construct is just no longer historically acceptable. Well, something has to be done to, to, to re-regulate in, in a sensible way. But again, what happens to the 40% of the people that aren't uh, paying for cable and still getting off the air TV? What happens if you have a line going into the home and the antennas are down? Do a they perfect, all have to pay? A perfect example of where we need separate subsidiaries in order okay. to ensure that their bills that they're paying for the, with the, for the telephone is not going to subsidize the, the cable service. They don't want cable, they don't plug into cable, and they don't pay for cable. And I'll work with Mr. Barrett and you and other construct a separate subsidiary that can wall that off and make sure you got the accounting, disaggregated yes, accounting sir. standards that are well staffed will get you the money to make sure you can do that and you can monitor Sounds that activity great. and we can move into that new era <laughs> where you're where you're moving uh, in that area. Uh, I'll, I'll close with both the potential and problems are mind-boggling. <laughs> I, I understand that but the consequences for the consumer every month now is mind-boggling given the increases all right so uh, I, I again you've got a heavy a slate of business in front of you, but as far as the consumers are concerned, they see it, what you do, through their telephone rates, through their cable rates. And you got to make sure that those things are put under control. And I'm, again, probing here because I want to find an area of common agreement. Let me talk to uh, Commissioner Marshall here first, and then we'll move back to you, Mr. Chairman, if we could. I just wanted to make sure that, that, that my total representation is not taken from trade publications. <laughs> no, I, again, you, I, will, I want to give you every opportunity to respond, Mr. Chairman. All right, so you want my view on telco entry into cable? Yes, And, and in please. my view, it's, it's not a question of uh, whether, but when and under what circumstances. And uh, I think that there shouldn't be too much problem with allowing telcos in on a common carrier basis. I have the problem, though, when they enter into the programming again, how we, if, whether we can have enough staff and enough accounting safeguards and, and so forth to actually deal with those cross subsidization concerns. I haven't reached a conclusion on that yet. I'm happy to explore it and learn more about it. Okay, good. I want to work with you. And uh, Commissioner Duggan? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have no ideological opposition. Uh, when I declare a certain skepticism about this, it has entirely to do with what has really been the theme of this hearing today, which is safeguards. Uh, I think there's an unfortunate process at work, and perhaps the participation of the Congress in this can help. There's an unfortunate process at work in which deregulation becomes a kind of mantra, and the desire to promote competition and to get people uh, into new uh, revenue-producing businesses becomes a kind of uh, religion. And we, we make the decision to be permissive there, and then we are firebombed to make the safeguards as weak as possible. I have absolutely no ideological opposition to the entry of the telephone companies into this business because they have a historic record of giving wonderful service to the American people, and they are distinguished companies. But I am interested in genuine safeguards and not toothless watchdogs. I agree with you 100 percent, which is why I always op adopt a a philosophy of uh, technological agnosticism uh, pending the safeguards which can be uh, put in place in order to ensure that as they affect human beings uh, that were properly anticipated all of the uh, unintended ramifications of any, um, any uh, technology which we're uh, hitting, uh, sending down their street or through their air. Uh, Commissioner Sykes. Yes, I would like to say first that we are working hard to make sure this is not a one-wire world. We're working with low-Earth orbit satellite systems. We're working with personal communications networks. We have just granted cable experimental licenses uh, to see if they can't uh, be providers of, of what might be called telephone services uh, through PCN networks, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What we are not doing, however, in the course of this is giving telephone companies uh, similar freedoms. I would completely concur that as we give telephone companies similar freedoms because they are uh, frequently larger providers, frequently enjoy franchise, uh, 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 statutory franchises from, from state uh, 
uh, legislatures uh, that we are going to have to have adequate safeguards in place and we're going to have to proceed aggressively with enforcement. And I think this commission has done both. Well, I understand that, Commissioner Sykes, but for the purposes of the American consumer, they're going to wonder what it is that you determine to be competition pending the introduction of the telephone companies or the satellite or the M M MMDS down their street in an effective way. For example, I'd be concerned about Boston. Other members on this committee might be concerned about Detroit, for example. And, um, and, uh, and, and if you redefine uh, competition, uh, to say that rather than three television stations in an area constitutes, for example, in Boston, it would be channel four, five, and seven. And if you argue that because we now have channel, channel 38, 56, and uh, 25, uh, that there is now competition and therefore no rate re-regulation authority should be granted to the, to the local or state uh, government in order to control uh, excessive uh, uh, charges to the consumers, my father would say, I've had those channels for the last 15 years, 20 years, 30 years in some instances. That's not competition to cable. I don't have to pay for that. I've got to pay, though, if I want to watch uh, HBO or watch CNN or watch ESPN. I've got to pay for that. Where's my competition to go get ESPN or HBO or Showtime? How do I get it? And all the rest of all those channels that the federal government was promising me that I would get if I, was de if I deregulated, if, if I went along with government deregulating the cable industry, would have lower rates, competition, and I'd get all these benefits. Where's that coming from? And all I'm saying to you is we've got to have the answers to these people. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and if we don't have them, if there isn't, a, a real uh, solution forthcoming from the commission, uh, then we've got two ways we can go. We either try to re-regulate dramatically the rates of the cable industry, which I'm personally uh, uh, have a preference for, or else we have to look for new competition. Satellites don't seem to be moving along as quickly as I would have hoped that they would until the telephone company sits over there as the repository of the uh, apprehensive goodwill of those that wish to uh, introduce more competition into the marketplace. It's a tough choice, but you've got to make choices. You guys have learned that. Uh, you, I'm sorry, you, you, uh, you distinguished commissioners have learned that over the last uh, several weeks. Um, my apologies, Commissioner Marshall. Um, let me ask uh, uh, one uh, uh, final uh, question, and, and that uh, is in the, uh, in the area of the inter-exchange uh, proceeding. Um, as you know, uh, in addition to the dominance uh, proceeding, uh, which is docket uh, 9132, uh, the Commission has two other closely related dockets pending that could have as much or greater impact on long distance market competition. The first is your remand proceeding from the Court of Appeals, which found Tariff 12 contracts to be unlawful. And the second concerns uh, the equal charge rule uh, the system of access charges long distance carriers pay for local origination and termination. Uh, since each of these seriously impact competitiveness in the same market, could you tell us how the Commission will coordinate its actions in each of these uh, proceedings? Uh, I understand that Commissioner Quello has another engagement and I, I appreciate that very much and we uh, thank you so much for your cooperation. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we are coordinating um, the uh, Tariff 12, Tariff 15 uh, proceedings along with the, uh, the docket that you referred to, uh, along with the uh, 800 number portability uh, uh, dedicated uh, common transport uh, and uh, credit card validation proceedings uh, trying to uh, make sure that we do not uh, uh, act in other than a comprehensive manner. Well, let me ask this, Mr. Chairman. Is it true that AT&T continues to file Tariff 12 deals every week and has now tied up some $4 billion, $4 billion in these long-term deals? I don't know whether they file them every week. They continue to file them, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. And the magnitude of the amount of money involved is uh, in it's the big. neighborhood of $4 billion? Yes, sir. Uh, what impact will removal of the equal charge rule have on competition in the long distance marketplace? 
Well, if, we, if we're speaking of Tariff 12, uh, then uh, you know there has been a great deal of anxiety on the part of users of Tariff 12 services, customized services, about what would happen if there was no opportunity for AT&T to provide customized packages. Let me let me uh, let me move on. I, I'd like to, rather than explore that more deeply at this time, just touch on a couple of other areas, and then I think we can break up the hearing. Um, the first one is on the new, the new fee proposal um, coming out of the uh, FCC. Uh, your testimony, your written testimony, states that in developing the proposed new fee schedule, that the FCC took into account factors including administrative costs, whether a service is commercial or non-commercial, and whether a fee had the potential to be a hardship. You also mentioned the use of good judgment and attempting to take into account ability to pay. From the comments received from various industry segments, it is not clear that the Commission's list of factors to consider was all-inclusive, since in some cases the proposed fees appear excessive or even unfair. Commentators have, for example, questioned the following aspects of the proposed fees. Assessment of public safety and public television uh, public educational television, per capita fees skewed against uh, telephone uh, common carriers, excessive hardship burdens on the satellite companies, inequitable fee assessments within the paging industry, unjustified disparities between VHF and UHF TV fees, uh, costly to administer cable TV fee basis, and exclusion of companies directly benefiting from new FCC programmatic initiatives. Could you explain, if you could, just philosophically, the rationale for the proposed fee levels and describe how the FCC will deal with these specific inequities as they are uncovered. For example, uh, could you please explain the logic for excluding the various equipment manufacturers, importers, and holders of de developmental and experimental licenses from additional fees at a time when the Commission is seeking uh, funding for large-scale improvements uh, to the FCC's Laurel, Maryland laboratory? I do not have an answer with respect to uh, fees on those who are by law required to submit uh, their electronic devices uh, so that we can test them to determine that they don't uh, emit uh, radio frequency in a harmful manner. Uh, they of course don't enjoy a license from us. They are required to uh, uh, submit to a regulatory process they would prefer not to submit to and the people that we have uh, have uh, suggested should be charged some fee uh, are ones who hold a license from us. So that's the principal distinction. Uh, I would say, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we'll work with the uh, committee in any way we can, uh, uh, providing as much data as we can to help uh, the committee in its assessment of these fees. I think that's going to be a, a very important task this uh, year, and I'd like to work with you and the other commissioners on this subject. I'd like our staffs to work together so that we've got a common understanding of what the objectives are and what the purpose, uh, what the use to which some of these fees could have been placed if uh, we had not uh, uh, taken them off the books. I'm not saying that I disagree with all of your decisions. I'm just saying that we ought to have some common rationale that we're all using uh, rather than just making ad hoc decisions uh, uh, down a list depending upon uh, you know, the personal pleading of each uh, industry. Um, and I have la one last question, and then we'll conclude the hearing. And again, it's on the budget of the FCC, which is, after all, the subject of uh, this hearing. Um, in the five years that I have been the chairman of this subcommittee, I have taken an active interest in promoting the development and the advancement of advanced television systems in the United States. Uh, it's now known as HDTV uh, kind of generically, but we know that it's much more complex than that in terms of uh, the potential means by which uh, it will be uh, deployed. Expeditious development of an advanced television broadcast uh, uh, transmission standard is essential to the continued health and vitality of the American broadcasting industry. However, it has come to my attention 
that notwithstanding the considerable investment made by broadcasters and others in the Advanced Television Test Center, it lacks adequate funds for field testing of proposed systems. In fact, in a recently issued interim report, the FCC's Advanced Television Advisory Committee indicated that the test center likely will need an additional $1 million uh, in personnel and equipment for field tests in HDTV. Now we're comparing this with billions in each one of the other areas. Here is an area that uh, many believe is central to our ability uh, to be a competitive uh, long term with the Japanese, the Germans and others uh, in these very sophisticated uh, areas of new electronic uh, breakthroughs, their applications especially. Uh, for the want of a million dollars, uh, perhaps, uh, we could be delaying uh, in, in a way that uh, could give an, an enormous additional competitive advantage uh, to others around the world. Now, in an attempt to address this issue, the subcommittee last year considered legislation that would have provided the Commission with additional resources uh, to complete comprehensive testing of proposed advanced television systems in a timely ma uh, manner. In your assessment, Mr. Chairman, does either the Advanced Television Test Center or the FCC's Advisory Committee possess adequate resources for field testing of advanced television systems? The, uh, I met with the Advanced Television uh, uh, Test Center people as well as the FCC's Advisory Committee uh, approximately a week ago, and I was told at that meeting that they had just gotten contributions from members of that uh, group uh, that would uh, provide money for, say, transmitters and other equipment uh, for field testing. Uh, you know, wh whether that's the definitive word or not, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. Uh, we have in the budget request uh, for next year uh, uh, additional monies uh, for personnel uh, that would be used both in field testing uh, and in what is uh, a crucially important job that we're undertaking now, and that is coming up with a new uh, table of allocations under this simulcasting approach. Uh, and, and I think that at least our Office of Engineering and Technology tells me that with that additional money, we can do what we have set out to do. So what would be your recommendation to us with regard to passing an increased amount of money for this purpose in this authorization or in a separate vehicle that could be available for uh, these purposes? Uh, I would be happy to provide information to the committee on, on any uh, field testing uh, uh, additions that, uh, that would be helpful and would, uh, would do that as quickly as possible, Mr. And, Chairman. And, and where you did, you would uh, request that we increase the authorization or find another vehicle in order to ensure that those right. monies if, were... If, if we need to do that, I would not hesitate to do that. Okay. Well, we'll look to your guidance on your judgment on that subject. And we'll work in partnership with you to Good. advance the, those goals. We, we uh, um, have, as you know, much more in common here in terms of our objectives than the uh, differences of opinion, which uh, sometimes consume a lot of our time. Uh, and I'd like to note in, in, in conclusion that in yesterday's children television uh, decision um, that uh, the public television stations of our country were exempted from the requirements that, uh, that there would have to have been uh, in each year, a, uh, a, a commitment of resources to uh, the educational and informational needs of the children who live within the uh, broadcasting area of a public broadcasting uh, station. Um, I can tell you as uh, the uh, drafter of the legislation out of the House of Representatives that the congressional intent uh, was that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, public television stations be covered. If there was any ambiguity uh, with regard to that subject, uh, I intend on remedying uh, that uh, this year in our reauthorization of the uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, and there we can spell out with uh, uh, clarity that will uh, not be missed by those with the poorest eyesight that uh, this 
is something that we believe should be dealt with as well by the Commission, and we will lay that out and we'll work with you as well in the uh, drafting of that language so that we can uh, do it in an appropriate uh, fashion. Let me just um, let me respond. I realize it wasn't placed as a question. I think a couple of commissioners, particularly Commissioner Duggan and uh, Commissioner Barrett, uh, were interested uh, in that being covered. They can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I have been uh, one that was not interested in public broadcasting being covered, believing that if you didn't think that they were acting properly, that through the Corporation for Public Broadcasting or other, you know, budgets that you would let them know that. But, you know, if that is a legislative intent, I would happily join with my colleagues. Thank you. Well, I think we can work together on that, and I can understand where there would be some uh, uh, potential ambiguity, and I think we can clear it up. Let me just say I, I thank you very much for your uh, patience today, um, and uh, given the list of issues that we went through this, this morning, uh, it's quite clear that any time that we bring you up here to Congress, we're taking you away from very important business. Um, but it's important for us to work with you, to understand what your rationale is as you move uh, forward through any of these uh, important decisions. Because as you know, uh, better than any, uh, the decisions which you make uh, have uh, potentially more profound effect upon Americans than uh, almost anything else that goes on here in the city of Washington. And uh, although they're complex and technologically oriented, ultimately they're going to affect the way in which uh, uh, the next generation of Americans uh, uh, interrelate with the information which is in our society. And uh, we appreciate the, uh, the hard work and the, uh, um, and the difficulty uh, of the assignment which you have been taken, given. Uh, I think uh, each of you in your own way enjoys the role which you play. It's evident from the testimony here this morning that that's the case. Uh, I congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, prodigious amount of work which came out of the uh, Commission uh, yesterday. Uh, it's a tribute to you that uh, you've been able to uh, uh, pull together all the various uh, themes in each one of those areas to produce results, even if there is differences, of, uh, there are differences of opinion that, are, that uh, everyone reserves the right to have with any of the individual decisions. I think it's a tribute to you that you were able to do so. And I congratulate you and the rest of the commissioners. And uh, uh, we, uh, with that, uh, complete this hearing. Thank you all very, very much. But I ask as the hearing wraps up to need them as quickly as possible since it's going to be needed for another hearing as quickly uh, as uh, soon as possible. And uh, we're going to leave the record opening open for additional questions uh, from other members of the subcommittee. Well, C-SPAN 2, created in 1986 as part of the C-SPAN networks, is brought to you as a public service, privately